Welcome, everybody, to Globebusters, the etheric science of quantum nothingness. I'm your host, Bob Xanadude60, and we are back with another great show for you today. And uh, yeah, lots of really amazing stuff has happened this past week, uh, going from Max Egan to the Max Egan debacle, I should say, and uh, going from that to the uh, Team Skeptic Nathan uh, Thompson debate, which was one of the most amazing things I have ever seen in my life. Um, I don't think the globe community will ever get over that. That had to be the most embarrassing thing ever uh, for them. But uh, we'll be talking about that. And then finally, we're going to be talking about um, the mainstream nonsense science of quantum mechanics, which is trying to essentially usurp um, the physics that were known oh so very well uh, pre-Albert Einstein um, before he came in and completely derailed it. And of course, you know, it's no surprise to me that uh, anything that the mainstream is pushing is usually, usually winds up to be the lie. And right now, the biggest thing in mainstream science that they're pushing is, of course, quantum mechanics. And, well, you know, it doesn't take too much uh, analysis to actually understand what an unbelievable lie this this science is, and uh, with absolutely no basis in reality. But we're going to be covering that today, amongst many other things. So get ready and hold on to your seats. But before we get to that, let me go ahead and introduce today's posse. Uh, first up, as always, is Jaron from Jaronism. How are you doing today, Jaron? Hey, doing well, Bob. Thanks. Hope everyone is having a great day. So hello to everyone in the chat, and hello to the panel members. Let's get going. Should be a good show. Yeah, I'm thinking so too. Beautiful. All right. And next up, we have Ben, Taboo Conspiracy. How are you doing today, Ben? I'm doing fairly well. It's great to be with my uh, Globusters family again. It's uh, always a pleasure, but uh, looking forward to the show. Yep, absolutely. And we're glad you're, you're here with us, Ben, for sure. And uh, I hope I hope things eventually improve for you and your family. I got to say that much. I still, I still think about that, and I'm just like, wow. <laughs> So yeah, I had someone cl say that I whined too much about that. So I'm going to try to shut up about all that stuff going on. But, uh. <laughs> yeah, I saw that comment and that guy's an idiot. I wouldn't worry about it. You're not whining about it. You're simply stating a reality, a fact of reality, especially in your reality. And I think it is, it's something that a lot of people are dealing with as well. And it's unfortunate, um, but it's, you know, it does happen to a lot of us. So, you know, to, to say something about it, I think is far from whining about it. And when I saw that guy comment about it, I, I just, I just thought, what a dope. But anyway, <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> yep. All right. So next up we have, uh, Iru Landucci. How are you doing today, Iru? 
Hello, Bob. Hello, everyone. Doing fantastic. Uh, hope you be a nice uh, show as always. Yeah, I'm gonna I, make short. I'm gonna make a short presentation because anytime that I want to express myself like in Spanish, I'm I'm starting to you know getting crazy and my my <laughs> my ideas start to swirling into fade out into the ether. So I'm gonna keep quiet. <laughs> okay. Well, you're certainly more than welcome to make a presentation. No worries about that. Thank so, you, sir. All right. And last but certainly not least, our newest Globuster uh, with, uh, from Tennessee, uh, Mr. Austin Whitsitt. How are you doing today, Austin? I'm doing good. Doing good, Bob. How are you doing? Uh, pretty interesting topic, so it should be a good show. Yeah, I think so. I think this is something that, uh, you know, several of us are, you know, have a, a big interest in. Of course, it goes without saying that this is something that uh, Ken Wheeler is interested in. And Cammy told me, by the way, and I didn't get a chance to watch it, but I understand that uh, Ken Wheeler came out with another show specifically on the ether today. And it's like, it's uh, I'm bummed that I didn't get to watch it before the show. But I guess we will, uh, I'll, I'll watch it afterwards. And uh, if there's anything groundbreaking in there, uh, we'll cover it next week. So there you have it. All right. Um, so, uh, first thing, Ben, I noticed that, uh, you, you posted this particular video that we're watching and actually let me switch over to, instead of this, let me switch to a different screen for you guys. Uh, switch screen to that one. Okay. So, um, you, you posted this one today, Ben, and, um, this is, you're right. This one is pretty interesting. Uh, somebody on the ground at mission control and, you know, one of the things that I caught about this is like they're showing, they're showing these really super high resolution pictures of the dragon here, right? And and how it's flying along, and then when they fish it out of the ocean, which is like down here, it doesn't look anything like it did in space. And I just thought, what kind of nonsense is that? You know. Um, but anyway, I noticed you you found it interesting, so you don't even have any comments on this. No, I mean, that's a great comment that you just had is it doesn't even appear to be the same craft, but also the, uh, the angle was way off. It's shooting, it's filming it from a distance and then all of a sudden it shows it underneath it. So it's another, just an impossible angle. It's just another blunder by, by space, SpaceX and all the other space nonsense. But anyway, but yeah. I do see curvature right here. I don't know about you guys. Oh yeah. That early curvature. Yeah, there's no <laughs> doubt about that. I thought that's that's pretty funny. That's a lot of curvature too, man. <laughs> Finally, we proved tiny, tiny, tiny ball. But but yeah, to me, this just shows you know the level of of cogdis and you know denial that the Globers go through. Here they are side by side. You know, on the right, you know, this is it from space, and on the left, this is it being fished out of the ocean, and it's like. They don't even, I, I mean, honestly, I looked at that and I'm like, is that supposed to be the same thing? Am I, am I reading this wrong? Um, and guys, correct me am I, if I'm wrong. Is this supposed to be the same module? <laughs> yeah, it's supposed to be, but, uh, you know, refraction. You didn't, yeah. you didn't take refraction <laughs> into consideration. Atmosphere <laughs> friction. <laughs> Compression. Compression, expansion, black yeah. hole, maybe, you know. Of, Dark matter. There's a lot of things. Yeah, it's a lot of things. Uh, it's a lot of things except real. Um, and and look, it's all you know rusted. Well, not rusted. I guess these are supposed to be burn marks, right? And why would this be, you know, burning? And if it was, if it ever got that hot, also when when they had the splashdown, right? Um, when it, it when it actually hit the ground, once again, these things are supposed to be up, getting up to over three thousand degrees Fahrenheit. And here it is, bam, not one iota of steam. It's cool as a cucumber. And, and there is just simply no way that, you know, just minutes earlier, it was coming in at 17,000 miles an hour, barreling through this, you know, so bad that it looks, look at all the scorch marks. It got that hot. And, and we're supposed to believe that in just the few seconds parachute ride that has come down, um, that it cooled down cool enough that it doesn't even make any sort of steam cloud whatsoever um, when it's, you know, two to three times as hot as, as molten lava, right? It's just 
absolutely absurd. And of course, you got to love this. The tell me what you love uh, shows the Elon Musk doing the dance with all the the uh, dollars bills floating down. Pretty funny stuff. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it really is. But my but, good but God, those are those are tax dollars too. Yeah, they are. Yeah. And in fact, this week, and I make it live again, the company of uh, uh, the French uh, company called um, CNES, uh, Ariane Aerospace, for the, I don't know how to say in English, but uh, like from five years ago to our day, they still are using the same video feed anytime they launch uh, a rocket. Uh, this time was uh, for Indian uh, satellite uh, communications purposes, but uh, they still using the same kind of uh, video. It's amazing. I mean, uh, I, I anytime that these guys go live, I I make a, a live show and. We have with the Spanish people, we have like a, some kind of ceremonial ritual and we are waiting uh, if they are changing the image. You know, we are in 2020 and uh, supposedly we have super high technology, but these guys, uh, you know, anytime that they uh, cut cameras between the launch and the supposedly uh, parking orbit and deployment and things like that, they use from six years, seven years ago until our day, the same video feed. It doesn't matter if, if it's night, if it's day. And I don't understand why invite uh, people to the uh, to the auditorium to see the lunch <laughs> if yeah. they are playing a, a video. Yeah. It's crazy. It That's is. Crazy. It's, it is crazy. It's taxpayer too. It's yep. our... Uh, it's not just taxpayer. It's it's human uh, <laughs> taxpayer. You know, I mean, uh, it's because ev everyone around the world. Uh, it doesn't matter your if it's your go is an agency for your government. I mean, they are stolen money from all of us. Yes, absolutely, they are. So, and and this this also was the was the other thing that Ben was commenting about. Um, so we're sitting here, we're watching this thing. And, you know, it keeps drifting. And this is supposed to be um, a camera that is being run from the ground. Now, is this a camera that is on the ground? It kind of seems like it's underneath it because I don't know how in the world, you know, they would necessarily get this angle from the ISS if it's coming down, right? So, you know, admittedly, I am spatially challenged, but would you say that this must be taken from below it, guys? It's difficult, but for me, it's uh, it's not real uh, time feed. Right? Well, we so know that. They, they, <laughs> of course, they are they are right. playing with all these uh, camera angle nonsense uh, qualities. Uh, you know, it's it's part of the show. It's part of the uh, trying to confuse people. You know, that's my opinion, of course. Yeah. Well, I think we fully agree with your opinion. We know, <clears throat> we know none of this is real. So it, it's funny because here we are. We're, we're reduced to critiquing the CGI cartoon that is happening here, right? <laughs> because there is no way that any of this is real. And it's just so pathetic. You know, they can, they can come up with any angle they want. Um, any, they can draw any scene that they want. The CGI is so good these days that you can't tell it from reality. And yet they cannot even get it remotely close to, to reality. And that just goes, again, it's another tribute to show you how unbelievably brainwashed people are, that they will simply accept anything that, that NASA or SpaceX or any of these agencies put out. It's, it's, it's sad. So, anyway. Yeah, I, I remember the satellite from uh, when, <laughs> poor people, I mean, the, the country Peru uh, a few years ago uh, decided to put an orbit like a nano satellite. So of course they contract uh, NASA, and the guys uh, in the ISS get out of the uh, of the ISS and took this the nano satellite by hand and uh, make the the an, an actual launch of satellite because they launch with the with the arm. You know, I mean. The, the, the astronaut, and this is for real, I can send you the, the video, the astronauts start counting down, start saying three, two, one, and after the one, he said, you, with that 
sound, you and drop the satellite by hand, making on turns, and that was supposedly, uh, no, supposedly the guys in the in Peru, they are looking live uh, inside the university that contract NASA to do that, and the faces of the guy was like, you know, looking at each other, saying, uh, "We pay five hundred thousand dollars for <laughs> dropping by hand." Making one, two, three, who? <laughs> yeah, I know. I saw that. It's amazing. amazing. Yeah, it was crazy. They're, they're launching. They're just kind of tossing them out there, you know. And what was funny is, is while they were tossing these satellites out there, uh, in one scene, the Earth was there. And then they panned just a little bit, and the Earth is gone. And it's like, well, where did the Earth go? You know, they couldn't have changed the angle enough for that to happen. But well, and and. and- Sorry, Bob, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> no, and, and, and I wonder, no, because I remember, and I wonder, like, the, 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 the satellite starts spinning crazy and it's a nanosatellite without any thruster. So at what point the satellite is going to self-orient it towards uh, Earth for sending, uh, sending signals? Uh, <laughs> I mean, supposedly the nanosatellite has, like, a period of uh, three months before enter to the atmosphere and burn. So uh, three months before enter the atmosphere and two months and a half uh, waiting for the spin stop. I don't know. I mean, uh, it's nice, no, insane. It's it's insane. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> I love this graphic with all the sheep applauding. <laughs> this is absolutely classic. <laughs> well, you know, I was just going to point out also is you know, like it, with common well, fake comedy shows, they always have that laugh track that, that's meant to, for, as a conformity thing where people automatically laugh with, with, the, with the show. But they do the same thing with these NASA and other launches and SpaceX, SpaceX especially, is they all cheer. I mean, no, but no company cheers like that. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Those are actors. Nobody does that. And so the, the idea is when they're cheering, then the audience will cheer too, just like the stupid sheeple they, they are. But, yeah. yeah, exactly. So you show or that they say that um, you know those employees for SpaceX actually get paid time away and get you know bonuses for showing up to those launches and cheering like that. That's been shown and proven easily. So basically, you have these people that uh, would never be there, would never show up, would not even care. But of course, if your job is going to give you paid time off and is going to give you bonuses for showing up and cheering, well, then that's what you get. Yep. Absolutely. And by the way, guys, uh, we may be having some problems on DLive. I'm not sure. Jaren tells me it's online, but I'm showing offline on my control panel, and I keep disconnecting from Restream IO. So I don't know if Restream is having some problems again, um, but yep. uh, we may be having some problems there. <clears throat> yeah, DLive's been, uh, I mean, uh, Restream.io has had some problems last week. So I don't know if that's part of it. Yeah, could be. But anyway. All right. So let's move on to the next thing. So the next thing I want to talk about, guys, <clears throat> um, before we go into uh, you know, the other subjects is specifically the, the debate between Nathan and, and team team septic, um, is we had I had a guy that I was watching a, a debate, you know, about earth curvature, and I think this even came up in somebody's debate. I'm not exactly sure what it was, but I'm going to show this. And this, right, by the way, is the Lakeweight Center Elevator by none other than Soundly, right? And he actually was using this as curvature evidence. Now, I want you guys to, to look at this really carefully. And I'm looking at this, and I'm like, what the hell is this supposed to be? Um, and I'm looking at it. First of all, you've got everything on the ground jittering all over the place, right, um, with respect to everything else, the sky or anything like that. And, you know, they're going up and down and they're saying, look, curvature, no curvature, curvature, no curvature. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, they're kidding, right? This is, this is right up there with the other soundly picture. One thing, you know, forget all this, look at the bridge, what's actually happening with this little bridge here, right? So when they go down and I don't know what kind of lens or whatever soundly was using to do this deception, you know, I don't know what kind of sorcery this is, but look what's happening to this thing. Look, this thing just gets getting steeper and steeper and steeper. And, and, and at the end here, it's almost straight up and straight down again. And so what's happening is they're getting this like horizontal type compression, you know, like, like that uh, piece where Sean Hufford and Red's rhetoric, you know, were trying to show curvature, 
I covet you, right, Jaron? Yep. <laughs> it, it seems like that's this is that kind of effect, right? So I don't even know how the hell you can do this, but I understand there are specific lenses that you can buy, or maybe this is an after-processing thing, Eero. I, I mean, what do you guys think about this? This is insane. No, and, and in fact, you, you can see clearly the mirage uh, effect uh, uh, for the, the, the narrow angle uh, that, you know, the, the camera is uh, going down to the ground and you start losing image uh, because you're going to have this effect of uh, self-refractive image. But, I mean, it's if we live in a world with that kind of uh, aggressive curvature, we live in the, I don't know which is the name in English for the Principito, the Princip, uh, it's like uh, this book uh, with the, the, the tiny character living on top of the spherical planet with the flower on top. I mean, it's it's a super small world. Right. Look, supposedly, look how much curvature you have. And... You know, you ask uh, if this is a post-production effect or something like that. I am not uh, sure if this is if this is or not. But the fact is, the the, the image is. I don't know why is why is so droppy. You know, it's like uh, dropping frames all the time. It's not like a fluid video playback. I don't know which uh, kind of uh, source made this uh, video. I don't know, maybe Soundly put uh, some raw image, some raw files for knowing what uh, he's doing. But And, and I showed this uh, at the beginning of uh, uh, the last year, uh, taken by a movie uh, called the Thomas Crown. Effect. Thomas Crown, yeah. And I have it here. If you want to, then I can play it. And, and it's the same effect, but it's for the angle. Uh, it's not... Uh, for the curvature. Yeah, actually, I'd love to see that, uh, Iru. So if you want to cue that up, that'd be great. But but yeah, I mean, this. I just want to comment on that because, I mean, you see it and that bridge angle goes up and down and up and down. And then they also have that other still image that Soundly constantly uses that shows this thing, you know, this bridge um, right here, right? And it gets, it gets so steep, it's like you would need a four-wheel drive Jeep, you know, to go over it. It literally goes straight up and straight down. And you know, of yeah, course, you nobody... look at those, those those hills in the back, those little <laughs> the, the little bridges in the back. I mean, my goodness, they're so steep. Why are they why are they tend to, you know they're much more steep than the ones in the front. That's Obviously, absurd. He's using he's using trickery here to enhance this mirage. I, I mean, we all understand that mirages and and uh, all those things can actually block your 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 vision. But he's manipulating this footage to increase that effect. I mean, fly a drone, you don't see it look like this. Yeah, absolutely never see it look like this is I, I mean it, it's absolutely that's 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 just more evidence they're deceivers they're liars they're scumbags yes absolutely and this this is the best evidence that they come forth with you know i i noticed that you know team skeptic was saying oh yeah go check out soundly you know we can absolutely see this curvature um, and he's of course referring to this because you know this the the lake punch train video um where these these Things are so horizontally compressed that it becomes ridiculous. And how anybody can possibly not see, you know, whatever is going on here. And like I said, I think that there are camera lenses that that do this. Somebody did a, a video on it, and I can't recall who it was. But apparently there are videos that you can actually do this, and you can bring this, like, curvature effect across the image um, on a horizontal plane. So... Yeah perspective thing too i mean it's just you know it's a awkward looking view but if you play that video again and you pause it when it's at the very bottom so right about you know there um and you look at that bridge and you kind of see how much of the bridge is being covered by the water there well you know that's not possible obviously the drone is still above the water level and yet even that little bridge part that's close to us straight ahead uh, has been surpassed by the water well you know that that's just an optical effect Clearly, the curvature between you and that little bridge there would not look at. See how it gets up, and we can see the I'm kind of talking about those two mountains in front of us, those two uh, steep angles, and then yeah, and then when you come down, uh, that the water would cover that. Like the curvature would be enough to cover those little bridges close to you. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, especially. I have I have ready when you want. Okay, go ahead, and, go ahead and share your screen. I'll switch over to you. What, what happened to your voice, Sharon? You uh, just wake up. 
No, I'm not feeling very good today. No, I can I can I can hear you, man. Is it sound? <laughs> no, you sound normal to me. I don't know. Oh. Uh, for me, like a little group, uh, a little horse, a little horse, yes, something yeah. like that. Yeah, if you want to sing that way. I think I could help. Okay, Whoa, that was okay. a major Whoa, echo. That was a major echo. Yes, yes. Uh, we okay. are. I am you are presenting. You are presenting. Yes, you are. Okay. Yes, you are. No, I, I'm going to recap because I showed this uh, quite a lot of time. But first of all, this is my. Uh, research uh, when you, um, for example, when you downloaded the understanding the astronomical refraction by NASA, uh, they, you know, you can scroll that's down in the PDF. Nice, Sorry. nice sound. Sorry. No, it's okay, man. It's okay. Uh, but you know, and this is for astronomical, proof, okay? But proof. for astronomical um, provided by NASA, they they recommend you like. Um, First of all, uh, you know, uh, take the surface as a flat Earth that is in his doc in their document, but they telling you like uh, in this gradient, uh, which represent like uh, 20 degrees, uh, this is not uh, able to, uh, you know, to see. Uh, it's not not able. It's not nice to take observations in this gradient. This is the horizon. Okay, the horizon, and uh, it's not uh, the best thing that you might do uh, for astronomical observation because, as everybody knows, we have that kind of reflection, uh, you know, uh, angular resolution, all this mirage, if you want to uh, put it that name, that happening all the time. Of course, this kind of behavior in the atmosphere depend in the uh, atmospheric pressure, the temperature, the variance, and all that kind of stuff. But that is why it doesn't matter if it's, if you are on the ground or if you are in the sky. It's based on the camera position and the, it's, it's based on the observer because here we are, we are like 3,000 meters above the sea level and at that angle we receive the same deformation. And here too, we are in the same astronomical observatory at that high, and we receive, it doesn't matter if this is in the sea le at sea level, like everyone's film, this kind of sunset, or if you are in the mountain, three uh, 3,000 meters above the sea level. You're gonna have a lot of time at that portion of the uh, relatively, you know, uh, observer position, you're gonna have that uh, compression. Of course, maybe at sea level, uh, you know, looking through an ocean or, or big body of waters, you're gonna have these effects more pronounced because you have all the, uh, the water vapor rising up into the air, right? So first that, then I remember they have here, um, first of all, or second of all, I always ask for the real tangible proof that an object that supposedly must be hidden, completely hidden be behind not just a curvature, uh, any obstacle, be a refraction, you can rise up and live at the horizon level without any kind of uh, major distortions. That nobody do that. No, we, we are waiting for that experience. When you're trying to recreate um, the Fata Morgana effects, the superior mirage, the inferior mirage that nature produced, for example, this is via nature, and this is the recreation in lab based on the Snell law and all the things that you want to put on top of that. Always the object is at the eye level with the camera. You have the fluid in the middle, of course, we have the atmosphere, we have the camera observer, and then we have the object. But it's all in the same line of view. This this paper, which is this paper here, and you can recreate, this is all miniature, okay? Anytime that a superior mirage uh, has, you know, it's produced, it's on top of the horizon level. It's never going, you, you're never going to have like inverted, um, a superior uh, uh, mirage uh, with this characteristic at the line of the horizon. You go always is going to be on top. That is the first thing that you must be have in mind. But nobody ever make a, a lab experiment showing 
how you could bring up shit that is completely uh, obscure by anything. It doesn't matter if the curve or, or whatever. So when you start looking into a few examples of that, I remember that I have it, I believe it's here. The, the butane uh, yeah. experiment? The butane experiment? No, the butane experiment I have here and I analyze, and that is not, uh, it, it's not, um, the camera is not aligned to the surface. The camera is on purpose putting, uh, like, uh, from beneath the, um, the, the chair, I don't know which is the name of that, you know, the table, and mm -hmm. it's producing like a, like, like a 40 degree angle. So it's like, refract it's like looking into like like a sort of um uh mirror that it produced the the butane gas i i have here if you want to then i we can analyze because i have all the the pieces of the video but it's not the same case because anytime that we are observe making this observation we are a like level surface we are looking straight we are not looking up trying yeah. to you know yeah. Yeah, then I can show you and you are going to uh, quickly understand. But this is the, the, the same thing that um, it's produced. Of course, this is from a movie. So the camera is super high quality camera because it's a film uh, standard camera. So it has a super high definition. It's an old movie at the Thomas Crown case. But at this part, the, the, the movie is just, you know, it's a, a, a camera on the crane uh, going down to uh, take a shot of the guy in inside the boat, that is the boat. I cut that part from the movie and I'm starting to analyze because here you can clearly see how if you change the angle and the elevations uh, and the conditions in the atmosphere are good enough, you can have that uh, building disappearance effects. Uh, right now we are looking the Twin Towers. We have this line representing the real horizon anything beneath this uh underneath this line it's just a uh, uh, refraction effect and uh here you have some buildings that it must be far away than this actual building here so when the camera start going down you start losing those buildings in the middle of the air not because there is some kind of curvature it's because you don't have the uh, uh conditions to uh resolve that so right now, hey, it's hey, hero, hero. I don't mean to, I don't mean to, I don't mean, I don't mean, uh oh, uh oh. What? Is, is, are you getting, are you getting feedback? feedback? Yeah, I'm getting a really yeah, major getting echo. A really major echo. Okay, and right sorry, now, you, sorry. Sorry, no, no, sorry. My, uh, I mean, right now, it's uh, still the echo. I don't know. Let's see. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I'm still hearing yeah, it on me. Not on you. Not on it's you. It's only when we talk. Only when we talk. Okay, let me just stop sharing, and now uh, we are good. Okay, let's see. Test one, two. Yep, now you're good. You must okay. have been sharing with audio on. Maybe that was it. Yeah, ex exactly. So I'm going to <laughs> reshare the screen without the without well, the audio. I, I I just want to interrupt really quickly on that. Sorry. Um, w did you see that video by Wide Awake recently, where he was testing the little boat there in the gutter? Did anyone see that? Well, anyway, not, he, he not, put a little boat in the water on a, in a gutter really far, you know, I think it's 30 feet long or something like that. And he added some hot water. He added cold water. He did these things, and every time it sucked the boat away. I mean, you could see the entire horizon came downward, including the boat. Everything just disappeared. Anyway, it's just fascinating. It's exactly what you see there uh, on your uh, clip right there with the, from the Thomas Crown Affair, how, it just, how that just gets sucked right into that. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you can re recreate this in love, uh, but you always need to the object be uh, in the same uh, uh, at, at the same properties of uh, uh, and in the same level that you are observing. Uh, it never it, it, it's never going to bring up object that if you are looking into a uh, straight line. And of course, any time that you put the camera on the tripod and you level on the seashore or whatever you want to take the observations, your camera is going to be always, is going to be in a straight line to the horizon. You're never going to point it up or point it down. So right. the, the, 
the, the thing is that, and in fact, for example, and let me just finish with this, but with this, but uh, when you look into some high cam, uh, some uh, altitude cameras or any camera that maybe is attaching the uh, outside of the rocket or that kind of uh, video footage. And sometimes you see curved lines in the horizon and, um, you know, maybe some guys say, no, but this is a rectilinear lens. Well, it not, it is not exist a super rectilinear lens. For example, when you look into the uh, Ken Quilliam, um, I never produce in, uh, pr pronounce it well, uh, Colum, Kellum? Kel Colum? Yeah, uh, the guy who, uh, you know, the master of the uh, uh, stratospheric balloons. Oh, uh, Dwayne God. Kellum. Dwayne, Dwayne Kellum, Kellum, I'm sorry. Exactly. All right. Exactly. Derp. <laughs> uh, exactly. When, when you look at his, uh, his footage, sometimes, uh, even in the, one, in the last one, I believe was the 18, um, he showed the infrared camera. And you perceive like a, you know, circular um, feeling of the image. And that's right, because for example, when you go to the official um, optical um, database, uh, they're gonna tell you that always the resulting image is gonna be a circular image because the lens uh, in self has that shape. So the light, is going to reach different, it doesn't matter the size of the lens, it's going to receive a different um, portion of the image. Right, and that and your on, eyes aren't going to change either. I mean, you still have those optical resolution exactly. limits to your eyes as well, which exactly. is going to be circular. Exactly. It doesn't matter if it's a biological lens or an artificial lens. It's, it's the way that it's produced that always going to receive that, um, that kind of... Uh, Oops, where'd you go, Iru? I, Iru, I think you muted yourself. Oh, no, you didn't. You're just Tell gone. Me. Okay, no, maybe the connection, the internet oh, there you connection are. here, it's uh, going a little crazy. So sorry for that, guys. Okay, you're back. But, uh, for example, okay, perfect. So for, for example, I, I create this quick um, uh, representation. This is rendering with uh, Arnold uh, render. And... Uh, for example, if I, let me just open the IPR. So here is a real time uh, rendering of that image. If you look it now, you are looking into like a geometrical world without any distortion via the atmosphere. And you're gonna see that the uh, horizon is a straight line, of course. But when you're trying to process or trying to simulate these kind of things, you must be have into account two factors. And one factor is the atmosphere, which I am not going to uh, process now. But the other factor is that effect that the lens produces, these effects, because that is why some uh, render uh, engine softwares uh, bring the option of the uh, radial, uh, radial distortion. So if I put a really low value uh, representing reality, reality in terms of the camera behavior, immediately you're going to start to see that circular uh, pattern in the horizon. It's not, it's not going to be straight any anymore. And let me just print an image to compare. And let me just pre-process again. So there you have it. You have like a non-realistic camera and with lens distortion or the real effect distortion that any lens produce. And in fact, if you transfer this to your eye, uh, that is why you have the feeling of our atmosphere or, or, or you have this feeling that you live inside of like a personal dome. Because when you transfer that to, for example, let me open a really quick video made by a, a friend of mine from Mexico that it's he also... Uh, uploading video from SAC and, and FA Core. So when you go to the knowledge about the um, study of the sky, in the past and in the present, and of course in the future, they're going to say that straight line in our sky uh, tends uh, to curve. 
That is why we see the path of the sun uh, appearing to curve. You know, all the things that we look into the sky are curving because that is the way, not just the atmosphere, but also our lenses, our eyes, it's uh, created. So when you start to put all this together, and, and of course you can, you can see, for example, when you see the big rift, of course it's a straight. It's, it's not curving, but when you have the when, when you have the opportunity to look in this way, you're gonna see like a straight. But when you're trying to look in a horizontal horizontal way, you're gonna see curve. But this is not the reality of this thing. It's that at least in my observation, okay? But the thing is that because we see as a circular, the the fact is that uh, let me just close. Uh, let me just do something like this. Imagine that you are a person putting, this is your um, field of view. Your field of view is gonna be always like this, circular. But of course you're gonna have like 180 degrees uh, of that kind of uh, perception. Let me just, I'm still here? Yep, you're here, we're here. Okay, yeah. okay. So let me just, uh, express myself a little better with the picture. I mean this, you're gonna have these, you're gonna have the horizontal view and the vertical view behaving the same way. So if you transfer this simple sketch to to this, you're gonna have like, you know, it's like a, putting a circle on top of another circle of another circle. Of, so you're gonna have this feeling of living inside of a dome, because it's the way uh, th that the lenses uh, the lenses uh, behave. Exactly. Yep. This is and so, and this and this is exactly why um, you know. And it's not just our lenses, our eyes that are doing this. Obviously, any camera equipment, um, any unless camera. you're using a fish fisheye lens or something like that, that has an exaggerated um, horizontal view or vertical view, which is going to introduce you know distortion elements into the picture. Um, but that is exactly right. And that's why, um, you know, taking those optical principles, we can use things like a, um, uh, a telescope. God, what's a telescope mount? I'm trying to think of a uh, EQ yeah, mount. The yeah, EQ mount. Yeah, the EQ mount telescope mount. Um, because it is tuned essentially to understand that there is this field of view that is dome shaped. And since. Exactly the camera obeys the same rules that our eyes do, um, then it, it makes it pretty easy when you're referencing either the North Pole or the South Pole, um, and you have that dome, uh, you know, a personal atmospheric dome, then the telescope simply tracks within the visual parameters of that dome, which are engineered perfectly to match the human eye. So yeah, this is this is really good stuff, Hero. Thank you. And, and you, you, you must be have into account that when I simulate the uh, radial distortion, this is not uh, the same thing as a uh, GoPro. If I want to simulate a GoPro, I really have this uh, type of lenses, fisheye lens, you know, right away, fisheye lens. And when you produce a fisheye lens, you are not able to add on top of that the radial distortion. Uh, because that is not the way uh, at, uh, the, the fisheye lens works, but that is the way of the regular camera, regular lenses work. So, you know, having that in mind, because I can, if I, if I install to uh, convert a regular camera like uh, in, in fisheye lens, I am not going to produce that. I want to have this like super stretchy uh, wide lens, but it never going to produce the same thing as a fisheye lens. So that is why any camera out there, uh, we, are, we we don't have, and in fact, I have a video here um, talking, and I'm not going to play it, but just for, for the record, um, I think it's called the perfect lens, and they trying to create this tiny quantum lens um, uh, balls, tiny balls to produce like a perfect lens, uh, I believe it's here. Uh, light is a wave because here, of course, all the guys behind the uh, the study of uh, lenses uh, they say that the 
light if it is a wave, not a particle. So they trying to create with this kind of um, technology, they going to trying to create like a quantum effects uh, in terms of the lens to produce like straight image. So we don't have that yet. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter which kind of uh, of lens you use, you're going to have radial distortion always. And on top of that, you need to add all the behavior. We don't have the ability to make like a vacuum in our world to doesn't have any uh, distortion in the light. So you're going you're gonna to be a slave always of the external condition in this kind of uh, thing. But uh, no... It doesn't matter the way you you you're trying to uh, to explain. It, it it's not a curve. It's all these phenomena and it, all these behavior, all these facts. Uh, it doesn't match with the curve. That's why you know somebody asked me recently. You know, oh, if you went up to space and you saw this curvature of the Earth and you saw this bending of the horizon, would you then say? I said, no, that doesn't tell me at all that the Earth is a sphere. My 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 eyes are spherical. My eyes are a lens just like camera lenses, there's always going to be the radial distortion. And, and therefore, just because you see the horizon seemingly bend to your eye, well, you can't see forever. So there's going to be a limit to your view, and that limit to your view will always be a circle. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And on top of that, I remember when I showed this, which is, uh, you know, you have, for example, here, and I had the same uh, part of that video from the movie. But here you have... This is these are the same image uh, taken for uh, from um, Wiki Optics, and you can see the same camera distance, but in different light um, uh, weather conditions, and you can see the effect that we have here, and here in the Kanigu. Then you wanna have this kind of effect like we have here, which is only the bottom part of the uh, uh, horizon the gradient, and then you're gonna have this is making uh, from the nature. Uh, you're gonna have the superior mirage like you have here. But of course, the image itself, the the official image, is it's a normal image. I mean, it's in in the flat plane. It's not um, that is which which uh, what we call lumen. Uh, but I mean, it's all atmospheric effects. It it and and when you go into the frequency of the light, and I showed this many times in the past, but when you go to refraction and you start looking into the frequencies uh, and the cycles of the light, of course, uh, when you have warm weather, the light is going to going is going to bend down, like we see here in Kanigu, for example, when we see this kind of stretchy uh, stretchy sun. Well, mm -hmm. that explains when you have here and you reproduce. Uh, what happens if you warm up the atmosphere between the source and the end uh, and the final terminal uh, in terms of the light that is producing? You're gonna have this pattern of the light, and when you go warm up the air between this, the light is going to going down. But it's not because the light or the object is going down. It's because that the, the temperature change the behavior of how we perceive image in the distance, if you want to see in that way. So we have a lot of, uh, you know, this is the thing that turned me crazy when the people said, no, well, but the flat earth, they, they invent things on top of things to explain. No, that is, <laughs> we are not trying to simplify the things because if you, went, if you are going to study the nature, you don't need to simplify because you are not able to understand it. Exactly. Yeah. But, you know, honestly, wouldn't it be a lot easier to explain those pictures like Kanagu and stuff like that? It's just that they were simply taken during a severe earthquake and the earth curvature was changing, right? I mean, that makes more sense, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry. That was Baller Bob. Get out of here, Baller Bob. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but uh, we we have a lot of uh, things to p put uh, on on the table to understand, you know, uh, all this uh, and all, all this observation. And on top of that, you have the the I don't know if I have it here. Uh, I believe I have some some place on 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 this uh, PowerPoint presentation. But remember the observation from um, uh, Tola Media. Uh, you know, uh, the the nice about the uh, 
um, the the she told a media observation from the plane, at least for him, for me, is that he is very high in the atmosphere, so he have like a more clear view. And let me just remain remind the people. I believe it's somewhere here, but he's on top of the standard, you know, atmosphere. So uh, he has like a more clear view of the horizon. And then on top of that, you have the uh, infrared filter and he reached, uh, he reached um, distances, which is impossible on the globe without any distortion. Yeah. Without well, that's any it too. Distortion. Yeah, if there were if there were refraction present and there were you know mirages present, there would be distortion, there would be inversions. But you know these things, there isn't any. It's crystal clear. You know, it's crystal clear exactly. So this is amazing. We are talking about like two times and a half the prediction of the globe. Yeah, this is almost one thousand kilometers to the horizon. We are talking about. 535 miles and the prediction of the globe is only 354 kilometers to the horizon yeah huge difference and we are seeing like 960 kilometers so almost three times without any distortion without any refraction so yep. but you know what the globe's done. response is to this right oh thanks no. for proving the globe yeah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I believe you have a, like a serious answer, man. I mean, no, no that you... was that was my serious answer. They really do oh, say okay. that. <laughs> Don't you think it's a little crazy? And I'm sure Ben has seen this too. That the website beyondhorizons.eu is now down. Which, wow. Yeah, the site doesn't exist anymore. Uh, you can still go to the Wayback Machine and get some stuff from it, but I mean, that's a pretty big site, lots of people who submit photos, lots of people showing that we can see too far. Again, it's not a flat earth website. What it is is simply showing, hey, these are the longest distance photographs ever taken. And of course, the longest ones don't match the globe at all. So they have to tell people about refraction and say that the light is bending and all that. But I still think it's incredible that, you know, flat earth comes out and then uh, all of a sudden that site doesn't work anymore. And you know what we should yeah, do crazy, is... Man. Is we should, Crazy. while it's still there, you know, especially if it's available on archive.org, is go and just download the entire site and then maybe repost it somewhere as a reference. You know, it may be part of a link or something uh, that we can add to uh, Stop, Look, Think or something. Mm, good idea. Some, somebody already did that, so I'll, I'll try to share that link. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. And I remember, um, and that is why I, I opened this. Um, Five, but this was also beyond the horizon with the infrared. They uh, look uh, through the uh, through Canigou, and that's amazing picture with the moon uh, in the horizon. And when you try, the, you you are seeing complete this uh, from I cannot remember, and I don't, and I want to uh, 666 meters, uh, and he are looking about. 265 kilometers in that picture with infrared. And you can see all the Canigou, right. even with the fog, of course, be because of the condition of the weather right. and the moon in the back. So yeah. when I start and, and, and I remember that I made like, um, um, you know, that's, you know, I made this video uh, analyzing all these uh, conditions and uh, going to Google Earth and trying to match the position. And I match the position. And of course, in the globe, it's impossible to see. And, you know, you do whatever you do uh, it's because you prove the globe Earth. Yeah, exactly. Oh, thanks for proving the globe Earth. Why can't you see the beach? It's like, because uh, we're looking 175 miles away, and the beach is how tall? How, how do you expect, do you realize that things get smaller and more condensed with distance? And when you're talking about, I mean, things get smaller, think of a, a telephone pole. I mean, you, you barely have to move a mile away to not see that telephone pole anymore. So now make it, you know, 10, 20 telephone poles high, 30 telephone poles high. You don't have to move very far until you cannot see that anymore. It's too small. So when you're looking across 175 miles, to think that you'd be able to see a beach is insane. It's an insane yeah. belief to even even think that that's possible. Exactly, exactly. 
So we 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 see too far, and and I remember that. Uh, uh, well, I I made it like the three D comparison with all the uh, you know uh, city on top and trying to match the observation with the atmosphere and blah blah blah, and that's you know n never match. But I'm not going to. Um, and and I change. I remember that I changed the index of refraction in the simulation, and you can see how the mountains appear to move up. But it's not that uh, the mountain is moving up. It's just because when you change the index of refraction, of course you're going to have all this behavior, and the objects are going to start to appear and disappear, and all the thing that only you can see if you make like a time lapse. And that day the condition is start changing, and you're going to see how the Supposedly, curve of the Earth is going to expand, contract, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, they soundly they, they are desperate. Uh, I mean, they, it's one of the, you know, the one of the most bad proof that you, as a Glover, is going to bring. It sound like bring to the table. <laughs> it's, it's insane. It's bad. And you know what? Uh, what's funny is when you when I was listening to the uh, Team Skeptic. Uh, Nathan Thompson debate. Uh, so Nathan Thompson is pulling these things out, right? And he's showing, he's just showing these pictures going, you know, how do you explain this? Well, and, and Team Spec Skeptic is coming back saying, well, what was the relative humidity? What, what, what was the temperature? What was the refractive index? What was the calculated this? None of this is any good. And you can't even explain any of this. I mean, it was, oh my God, it was hilarious. You know, trying to mumbo jumbo and then, it up. And then he uses... And then he uses the refract these obviously refracted images like Soundly's as proof of the globe. You know, <laughs> refraction only exists in creating this this uh, magically disappearing uh, tall walls of of water. It, refraction can do that. Raise city sky, you know, city whole whole entire cities up above the horizon to look, you know, without distortion. Refraction can do all that, but it can't. You know, it, it, it just but, think but Soundly's like, video is perfectly fine. You know, refraction think, doesn't exist there. That's just a drone, and it's so funny that we all take off and land in, in planes, and you don't see <laughs> exactly. take off in a plane, and all of a sudden, all these buildings reveal themselves as you, and just think that that drone is, what, a maximum of a 1,000 feet? So, I mean, you're talking about in just the first, I don't know, 30 seconds of a plane taking off, that that's what you would expect to see when you look out the window, is that... Up, oh, we're down low. Now all these buildings are hidden, and as soon as we get up in the air, all the buildings magically appear from the distance. That's not the way it works. <laughs> exactly. And here I have the. I remember what uh, I did with the butane tank. And first of all, uh, in the experiment, this object is not beyond. It's not uh, underneath the butane tank. First of all, it's not. I mean, the, the, this is the, this is the the 3D recreation. You can see that the observer, on purpose, it's going up in this direction. That's the first thing. That is not uh, you are not simulated uh, what we trying to match, which is this uh, level observer. Then you have that the objects are not back. Uh, are not under the butane tank representing the curvature of the Earth. They are at the same height. They're not. They're not below. They are not, not below. Oh, Thank you for translating me, Jenna. No problem. So that <laughs> is the second thing. The third thing and most important: we don't live under a butane atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that's that's the uh, you know a spoiler alert: uh, we are don't <laughs> breathe uh, butane gas. <laughs> which has a really huge, uh, not huge, but it has a really high uh, index of index of refraction in comparison with the Earth. We have 1.33 uh, uh, at the you know standard pressure and uh, standard temperature, uh, not ten, standard 20 degrees Celsius temperature. But I mean, when you compare that with air, air is like 1.0005 in terms of the index of refraction. That is uh, why you need a really long distance to accumulate all that uh, low index of refraction to produce like a glass distortion. <laughs> and that is why when you go to the lab, uh, if you if you are not going to recreate a lab of 20 kilometers in, of the, in size to recreate the atmosphere, you put, you put a, like a, 
a glass with water and trying to em emulate that. But that uh, that was all the condition. So when you start looking into, um, for example, when it's rise up, it's because the butane gas when you um, you make the like a contrast and uh, you know like a, when you put like brightness and contrast filter you can see that it's here it's producing like a um, water layer on top before uh, start going around the butane tank so here when you see rising up it's not because it's rising up it's because here is invisible layer of thick liquid yeah so when it's... when you start to put in all this together the camera angle the liquid that is is here is not the you know me what i mean it's not the gas it's a liquid layer yeah that it's is... it's absurd it, yeah there's no way that that whatever you know what's a pretty it amazes me Iru, that they have not gotten one of those um toy mirror scopes are you guys familiar with those? Cami uses them all the time. They're like a half parabolic um, yes. type of dish. And um, I've actually got one up on a, a picture here, but uh, when, whenever you're done with your presentation. Um, and I'm surprised that they haven't taken something and sent, shown it in the bottom of the mirror scope and saying, all right, see, so here it is, and then this is what refraction does, and then shown the holograph on the top of the mirror scope. I honestly am waiting for somebody to do that, you know? It's just it's it's crazy yeah. how far they want to reach. <laughs> and, and, I, I and also here, wanted to, I just wanted ahead, to point out if you notice in in the other video in the actual butane there video, you'll notice that the clay on top doesn't move. So it what we what we don't see, for example, when you're at like the Chicago skyline, the top three hundred feet of the uh, uh, is shouldn't be hidden uh, according to the globe math. That top three hundred feet or something should still be visible. So they're saying, but when that raises up, you don't see it distort where half of, half of it just comes up and, and, and replaces the other half. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, but, but uh, yes, completely. But that is because it's only, uh, you are bringing the, the, the clay, the red clay uh, into the view because it's only this thick layer of liquid. That is right. why it doesn't distort the, up, the upper part of the clay. And, and so I've been trying to say that with the, with the globe zealots is, yeah, I, I ask them on my videos where they say, oh, it's refraction. I say, okay, which part of these uh, oil platforms are re refracting? And and they can't answer it because you would see that obvious distortion. So like when he pours it on, you see the red, the top of the, the whole object doesn't move. You're no. just seeing it's what the, the liquid layer on top is probably just creating a lens, which is causing the, to that, uh, uh, that lensing yeah. effect, which creates the illusion that it's coming up, but it's not. No, it's not. And in fact, I recreated uh, via a computer, and I have obtained the same uh, the same prediction based on this property. Of course, the computer simulation is more or less than the reality. But the other thing is that the red part appeared because it's still on the view. It's not under the curvature of the butane tank. It's at the same line of view. So when you drop liquid and that thick layer of liquid act as a, as a glass, of course you're gonna bring images or object or, or whatever is in back because it's still in the same line, it's in the same height, it's not under. And we are talking to bring object that is completely obscure, no via the observer. Right, because by hundreds, the, if not thousands of feet, no less. Well, and of course, all that, <laughs> yeah, and of course, all that. So the butane tank, it's uh, when you're trying to um, understand it, it's like here, for example, with, with this, I finished the presentation. Sorry for my long presentation, but the liquid is creating like a mirror. And of course, at this kind of angle, even a transparent uh, liquid is going to produce this Fresnel uh, effect where th when you aim to the camera in this lower angle, uh, the, the, um, the transparent uh, behavior is going to fade out into like a solid mirror. And that is a Fresnel effect we, we use all the time in computer. So that is why the guy put the camera under the chair looking from down to to top 
trying to find this Fresnel angle, dropping all the liquid of the butane with the high index of refraction, uh, creating this thick layer of liquid. You know, the, the, that is not the same thing that we're trying to match in reality, which is like a level observer with object under the right. supposedly curvature. So if I want to bring that green table, if I want to bring that green table into a view, I put the camera, if I put the camera like uh, in a level, uh, a level straight uh, observation, I am not going to, to do that. But if I put the camera a little down and I point it up, I'm going to have this mirror effect. You understand yep. what I'm saying? Yes, absolutely. So that is, these guys all the time they use this kind of trick. You know, they, they need to, I uh, know I'm going to put a little down and trying to, and don't ask me to recreate the same experiment again. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. Another point I always say is go ahead and, and recreate that experiment. If you, if you can think objects can levitate above the, the curvature, then put a, a three foot, for example, three foot fence on, on the Bonneville salt flats and put an object that should be geometrically hidden behind it and put your time lapse on and let's watch that object magically arise above the fence. Let's just see that magic effect. They won't ever show that. They never even try it because they know it's absurd. Right. Even rising is a three foot fence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. I'm stop sharing. But Let okay. alone over half a mile or mile to get, you know, Canigo to appear. Yeah. Yeah, Canigo. That's crazy. And okay, so and Ben, I put this up there, the beyondrange.wordpress.com, uh, which is the apparently the mirror of the Beyond Horizons website which is great. So, and I'll put that in the show notes for everybody, but, uh, excellent. Okay. So, uh, let's move on. Let's, <laughs> I guess we'll talk about this for a little bit. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we talked about this on Friday on the, on journalism lounge, but well, you know, well, really we did and we didn't. That's true. But we shouldn't, we shouldn't have, but we, we kind of did. And it was, and wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't. It, it it is it isn't but you can think of it as is so <laughs> <laughs> all right so little backstory on this for those who do not are, are not aware of this is max egan who has been a truther you know for quite some time um and actually i have to admit has done a lot of good work um but has always been adamantly against flat earth right and in fact we uh three years ago myself jaron david weiss mark Sargent, we had a debate with him and, you know, after that debate, he went on for weeks talking on his show, you know, about that debate and how we were, you know, introducing a PSYOP into the world and it was there to discredit the truth community. You know, the same old rhetoric that we get a lot. Well, so th uh, three, four, five days ago, something like that, all of a sudden, Max is laying in bed and he gets a beam of light that comes out of nowhere, hits him in the forehead, penetrates his pineal gland. And suddenly, ah, he sees everything. He understands it all, right? And he's, he thinks he's the chosen one or something. And so he then proceeds to make a video um, saying, you know, absolutely with no reservation whatsoever that the earth is in fact flat. It is in fact an enclosed system. Um, it is controlled by completely parasitic and psychopathic world uh, people, which I don't disagree with that. Um, but um, so he goes off, you know, completely in talking about, you know, the ball is a lie. Um, he said he finally, you know, he just finally got it. Right. And, you know, then went on to make some pretty absurd claims uh, about it, you know, and other things. And it's like, okay, we're not going to really talk about them so much, but then the very next day, um, I went back and because he said he was going to reveal his real name and all that stuff and some, you know, he was going to elaborate on some of these details. Well, the first thing he said um, in this video that I'm showing right now called The Truth Trap um, was that, well, I, I'm glad I got the attention of everybody and flat earthers and everybody and then proceeded to turn around and do basically a complete 180 on what he had said. So I'm going to play a couple sound bites here of what Max said, um, you know, in his rebuttal to himself um, and his explanation for it. And, uh, you know, then we'll, we'll kind of comment on it. But here we go. Let's listen to what Max says here. Now I do. A lot of things have been made clear for me. But um, 
how can how can you have a globe and how can you have a flat and how can you have uh, a holographic universe because that, that's the reality i mean the globe universe or the globe earth the flat earth the holographic universe the fractal universe the electric universe they all fit together and they all exist coexist at the same time and i'm going to try to explain to you how that works at the moment yeah, that ought to be good, seeing how a ball and a flat plane fit together. Um, but, you know, Max is going to explain it to us, so here we go. The Earth that we live on is a globe. It's a beautiful globe Earth. But the Earth that we operate on is also flat, and I'm going to try to explain this to you, how it works, you know, because, again, it, it depends on what you believe. Belief is subjective. You know, truth is subjective depending on what you want to believe. And you can have two truths. It depends on what your belief system is. And, you know, and it looks at how virtual reality is cre created as well. I mean, we think it's going to be all these computers we build and they're going to transfer our consciousness into a mainframe and rah, rah, rah. Well, yeah, they are. That's what they want to do. But the question is how they're going to do that. <clears throat> What's the MO? You know, is it going to be hooking us up with SCART plugs or something? Or is it just going to be done with Wi-Fi? You know, because that's the way it's going to be done, folks. Because that's what they tried to do with me on Saturday night but I'd, I'd looked at the whole thing with, with flat earth and globe earth and I thought well hang on both are possible the earth is a globe yes the earth is flat yes and they can both coexist at the same time and as soon as I uploaded that video they thought wow we've got him and they hit me but I, I don't believe either one I can see the truth in each one but I don't believe either one so I <laughs> okay so this has got to be one of the most incredible demonstrations of absolute doublespeak that has ever been, you know, displayed, honestly. I mean, the world is flat. It's a globe. It's real. It's not real. I believe in it, but I don't believe in it. Um, did, did I miss anything? I mean, what do you guys think about this? <laughs> yeah, and he also has a swastika on his hand as well. Well, that's for good reason. It, it, it helps him fight off parasites. <laughs> that's what he said. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't, yeah, I think Bob said it well. I mean, it's just a whole bunch of double speak. And, uh, yeah, like I said, I mean, like we said, I think Max has done some good work on some subjects in the past, but really when you look at the whole body, it's a lot of confusion. It's, uh, a lot of nonsense and it's just very easy to kind of go back and forth and say things like that and uh you know just kind of dance around issues and and never really put forward a coherent thought it's yeah. just it's it, you know it's it's hard to even comment on because what part are you commenting on what what do you how do you argue with somebody who says well it's both you're like well it's not okay well and then it depends on what you believe well okay well you just get to the point where you can't even formulate a argument against or for what he's saying because he kind of does it all for you it is and it isn't it does and it doesn't uh, it can be and it can't be and then at that point you're just you're kind of stuck you know chewing on your tongue so i mean that's the way i look at it it's just hard to even follow i, I tried to follow this video and I, I i got lost i just said i don't even know where he's going or what he's talking about and and then like we commented on on friday he's got some comments or some uh you know his little description where he's talking about hey if i'm ever on camera saying that i think the earth is flat and that i'm the chosen one you can know that it's a deep fake which is r ridiculous because just the day before he made a video where he was saying he believes that the earth is flat and that he's the chosen one so how do you say that oh if you ever see a video like i did yesterday it means it's a deep fake well we just didn't see that video yesterday so was the video yesterday a deep fake it's just stupid but but could be could be a, a, a you know maybe out there in internet is going to be like a deep fake uh, max egan uh, video but i don't ask, i don't believe that max egan is going to upload it to his own youtube channel no right <laughs> so that exactly. with the with that with that uh, thing with the bank all the nonsense theory of max egan uh, Thing. <laughs> if, you're, if you're afraid of deep fake technology, here's one bit of advice. Don't go on camera saying exactly the things that you're afraid that the deep fake will make you look like you say because you just you just finished the project for them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and please he must be add on top of that that supposedly and someone 
uh, stole my uh, password to the YouTube channel and uploaded without my permission. Right. <laughs> no, and some people have been sending so, me so, little things that he said or little comments that he said, or I don't know, it's either on his Instagram or something, but he's just he's just kind of lost it. And hey, if I disappear for a few days, it's because I haven't had a day off in 15 years. I'm not sure that's the case, but, uh, you know, don't anybody say I've been arrested. It's just, it's very convoluted. And I've, I've you know, people who are in the truth community deserve better. That, that's all to me. That's what I got to say. So yeah, what do you think of the narrative that he's sharing? I'm actually thinking that this is the one that's coming. I actually think we're going to see a whole bunch of people jumping onto this. It is a globe and it's flag idea. Uh, yeah. Again, I, I think when you when you say that and you're talking about in somebody's reality, um, then what he's saying is is kind of kind of true in a way that, you know, if I think that the earth is flat, I can live my life with that belief. And I can to me, it's flat. And then somebody else, they can live in a world where they think it's a globe and to them, it's a globe. Both those things are true. But wh where you're missing the point is only one reality is the case is objective. Right? Yes. Right. You can, yeah, you can go on and on and say, well, what people believe is true to them. And how, I, that's what I'm saying that some of the things he's saying, you're like, well, you, can, you can't necessarily argue with that. Um, if, if I think I'm, you know, six foot two and somebody else thinks that I'm five foot seven, only they can believe that and they can live their life with that belief, just like I can live my life with the belief I'm six foot two. Only one of us is, ab is actually correct. But you can say, well, it's true that they can live with that belief. Well, you can't argue with that. It is true that Bob can live with a belief that I'm five foot seven. It just so happens that if we actually get out and we measure it and we test that, that one of us will be proven correct and one of us will be proven false. That's where he's missing the point is that, sure, yeah, somebody can live their life with a belief that the Earth's a globe and to them that is true, but it doesn't make it true. It just, you know, it's all, it's all word salad, really. I, mean, I don't even know. So I kind of agree with what you're saying, Ben, but... Um, if more and more people come out with that thought, are they saying that it's both in reality? Is that what he's really saying? I, I mean, that's ridiculous. Well, that, that's where I think it's going. Is just, yeah. that, you know, think of the people who actually have this idea instilled in them that the Earth is both a flat and a globe. We go out there and we prove that it's flat. It's like, oh yeah, because it is flat and, and it is a globe, without it making any sense whatsoever of believing that. That's. That's why I actually think this is a little bit deeper than him just being, you know, going nuts here. I actually think he is giving us the narrative that we're going to start seeing. Hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, he's I actually to, to res respond to Ben. I actually agree with that. I think that this is just damage control, which is why I said I haven't seen much of him, but it's so perfectly crafted to where you can't be wrong. That's all it is. You can't be wrong. So when people start to wake up to the fact that the earth is wrong or it, we've been lied to about the earth. Well, yeah, of course, because this is all simulation and this is all a path of us becoming enlightened. And we're not quite as advanced as whoever created this. And you're right no matter what you believe. But the bigger the bigger subject here is how do we evolve or how do we get past this impending doom or whatever it is. Anything they can do to kind of, um, you know, pull the attention away from the fact that we're exposing that that it isn't a globe. Yeah. Well, and, and my take on it is, you know, first of all, I have to wonder if Max just hasn't, you know, lost the plot, if he isn't losing his mind, because here's the way that I'm seeing it. I mean, Max has always been an outspoken advocate against um, Flat Earth, and then he comes in with this nonsense. But here's the other thing, is Max is, is well known in the truth community. He has done some really epic work in the past. But when you come out and you start saying like, you know, things like this, his audience is not so dumb as to just swallow it and say, yeah, okay, yeah, it could be both, could be a sphere. I mean, they're, they're not going to accept that. So the question then becomes, what is, what is actually happening with Max here? Is he, you know, has he been compromised in such a way where he's not only trying to discredit Flat Earth, but discredit himself by coming across as a Looney Tune um, or, or what? You see what I'm saying? I mean, this doesn't make any sense for him to take this approach to try and dis uh, to di try and discredit flat Earth, because all he's really doing at the same time is discrediting everything he's ever done in the past. Which you know, it's a lose lose scenario. You know? Yeah, and, and in fact, I I was listening uh, the Jelani's and lunch uh, on Friday and. Uh, I, I cannot remember who, but uh, they pointed out uh, that he he doesn't say nothing about technical 
of the flat Earth. Right. Right. He doesn't. She, she, she's, you know, yeah, no. it's Rodrigo. Rodrigo was ah, saying Rodrigo. exactly that. That Right. If, if somebody comes out as a flat earther, usually the thing that follows is all the evidence that goes there. And he didn't do any of that in his original video, right? He just yeah. said, he was just saying words. Yeah. And, and, and it's also come with surprise and maybe angry or, or some kind of emotion. And this guy is like, uh, oh, yeah, all the time I, from the my childhood, I know that the earth flat is obviously flat i mean it it's it like a not emotion or, or not angry or not uh, even saying nothing about uh, the powers uh, you know on top or you know no no nothing no is no history no technical stuff no measurements no proof no evidence nothing yeah yeah and then he goes on and, and you know he talks about well Maybe this is the elite's agenda because, I mean, we're all aware of what's going on with the transhuman agenda, right? Um, yeah, they're coming out with technology that's being implemented and put into bodies. You know, if you're a Star Trek fan, essentially you would, you would look at it as they're trying to convert us into the Borg, right? These, these half-human, half-automaton um, kind of creatures. And, you know, that may be true that they're trying to do that and get us, you know, somehow to upload our consciousness into a machine, which, frankly, I don't think can ever happen. Uh, I, don't, I simply don't think that's impossible. I do think it's possible to teach a machine to mimic personality uh, characteristics. I think that's absolutely possible. But to actually physically upload someone's consciousness into a computer, that's absurd. You know, it, it, no, it's pretty sure we're all in agreement with that one. Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, I always said, like, uh, like, like for example, um, uh, you know, this this notion about atoms and uh, gluons and anything, every particle out there that it's impossible to observe because it doesn't exist, or the guys who deny the ether, but they talking about consciousness, like if we uh, if it was something tangible. I mean, you cannot transfer consciousness because it's like, for example, saying, okay, I go and transfer love because I make like a heart transplant. Yeah. No, <laughs> you cannot transfer consciousness because consciousness is not, it's, uh, it's not a tangible thing. It's a concept. It's a human concept to describe who is in charge of your body. <laughs> exactly. So the guys who believe in consciousness but they don't uh, believe in spirit or in soul or in astral projection. No, no, that's crazy. But they believe in consciousness. <laughs> I mean, it's, <laughs> it's insane. You cannot transfer love. You cannot transfer consciousness. That's my opinion, of course. But uh, the fact is uh, the consciousness is not in the brain. Even the memories is not in the physical brain. No, it's not. It's... So what, uh, there's more of an information field that's going on there. And not only that, I mean, yeah, there's physiological reactions that accompany love, you know, um, that can be mimicked by drugs. Okay. No doubt about that. So, but still, how are you going to upload that into a computer? Um, you're not, uh, it's just, it's no, just really and, ridiculous. And, no. And, and, and most important, you are not going to transfer your love or your consciousness. You can, uh, the computer mimic, but it's not it's not going to be yours emotion or your consciousness. You can mimic Irulanducci with computer because you have all this uh, AI uh, computing power to simulate me if you want to. No, saying that way we are just playing games here. But it's never gonna be yours. You transfer yeah. to another device. Yep. You know I've seen a couple of movies. Oh, go ahead, Ben. Or Austin, or whoever was going to talk. <laughs> I'm just sneaking in here. Oh, Rodrigo! Yep. Didn't even see you, buddy. <laughs> Go ahead. You mentioned you mentioned me, and uh, I, I wonder if you've seen the the film, the Iru, the recent film with Keanu Reeves, where that's exactly what happens. Like he he, <laughs> they, it's a no, no. Movie. That's it's what yeah. BS movie. It. I see. I, I, see the plane. I see on the plane. <laughs> It's terrific, it's terrific. Oh like a, a robot from, uh, for himself and uh -huh. help to work in the company while he goes uh, to holidays. You know, what I mean? he clones yeah. his family. Yeah, he clones. No, it's crazy. Oh so, my goodness, yeah. so bad. You, you know, I yeah. gotta wonder. So what, did, what did you guys? 
I was Go just ahead, gonna man. say, what do you guys think of his delusions of grandeur that the end of the world is gonna happen before 2022 because of his passport? I was sold. I was sold. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> I've, I've marked my calendar. Synchronicities, man. Yep. I mean, after all, Neo's passport expired on uh, September 11, 11. 2001. So <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> but then again, there's always the idea that since he's now said it, that it won't happen. It won't come to fruition. So it's good that he got it out and now it won't happen. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and I have to wonder, honestly, with, with the transhumanism, and, you know, I've seen a few movies um, that are about that, right? Specifically about being able to transfer the human consciousness into a computer. Uh, we see this, this robotics thing where they're implanting into the body. And I have to wonder if at some point they're not going to try and make a mass appeal. You know, maybe this is the mark of the beast or something like that. But they'll try and make a mass appeal to people to say, look, we can now do it. We can upload you to this computer, but in order to do that, of course, you have to leave your body, meaning, i.e., we got to kill you, and we're going to upload you. And they're going to convince people um, that that can be done by, by mimicking people's personality traits so well that, you know, somebody's going to go, oh, my God, oh, my God, that's exactly the type of person. You know, I honestly wonder if this isn't exactly where they're going to go with this. Well, well, uh, you are not only won the Nobel Prize, but maybe you are going to win an Oscar, too. <laughs> <laughs> but it's similar to the cryogenic stuff. It's a very similar scam. They say that they they're gonna you give him two hundred thousand. I don't know how much they yeah. They Walt keep Disney your body. is in the yeah. cryogenics. Yeah. Huh? Walt Disney uh, is in cryogenics supposedly. Ah, oh, well, I was young. The the story behind Walt Disney was like he got he get cancer and he's in uh, you know freezing cryogenics and maybe someday when the cure for cancer is going to appear in humanity, they of course when you are a child you believe that, but that was like a urban story mm -hmm. in Argentina at least. So right. sorry for my interruption. Program. Yeah, no, but they, they're doing this now, you know, right? They, they, a lot of people are doing this. And if you, one of the craziest ones is, is that guy Kurzweil. And I think he's in charge of Google's AI or crazy stuff. And he, I mean, this guy is a guy, he doesn't, materialists, they have this idea that they, they can transfer the consciousness into a computer and they want to live forever. They very afraid of dying. They don't believe in anything else. Um, and uh, it, it's very scary for them, and they try to supplant it with this zilgenics uh, with technology shite that they have, which is so stupid. Yeah, for sure. So anyway, I don't know, guys. Um, you know, take it or leave it. Um, I, I, I'm honestly more concerned that you know Max didn't really put any dent in flat Earth, not by a long shot. But I'm more concerned. Uh, that he has put a huge dent in his previous work of all the good truth seeking and you know exposing a, a lot of things that he's done in the past. Um, and, and in addition to that, the other thing I think is absurd is he actually believes that Christchurch was real. But you know whatever. Other than that, you know Max has been pretty good. He's been a a pillar in the truth community. But I really I don't know if he's been compromised or if he has lost the plot. But at this point. I honestly don't think I could ever take anything he says serious anymore. But, you know, that's just me. Everybody's got to, you know, take the good with the bad, I guess. When you come out with some of the things that you say, like you said, it, it hurts your past work because he did great work when I first started looking at him. Well, he's done a lot of work on, like, uh, the, the benefits of cannabis and how it cures and how the government kills and how medicine kills and cannabis cures, which I agree with, right? But now, all of a sudden, if I can just say to him, well, yeah, for those who believe that cannabis cures, it does cure. And for those who believe that it harms, then it does harm. Then you've just lost everything. I mean, he did, he did great work on chemtrails. And it's right. the same thing. Well, if I believe that chemtrails exist, then they do. And if I don't believe they exist, then they don't. So right. it just at this point, you're kind of like, I mean, he's done great work on fluoride. And now I'm thinking, I'm like, okay, well, maybe he's in the... And, and that might be fine if that's his way. But then that's really a confusing... Uh, thing to take is just okay well if you believe fluoride no fluoride does damage i think in my opinion whether you believe it does or whether you believe it doesn't um but you know I, and again I, like i've said before i'm not maybe i'm just not where he's at yet maybe eventually i'll be in that <laughs> crazy world where yeah. i just say well, yeah it's all 
uh, I still think there's some objective truths that we can figure out and dissect and talk about. And I just think it kind of hurts everything when you just now are in this kind of, well, it is and it isn't and it shouldn't be and it should be. Um, you know, no, governments out there are doing damage to their citizens and there's tyranny everywhere. You can't just say, well, no, it, it's only that way if you believe that. And if you don't believe that, then they're not doing damage. Hmm? I yeah, well, uh, you, you just haven't been chosen yet, Jern, that's all. So you're, you're not there yet. I yeah, did put it soon. I put a big white light above my bed, and I'm hoping that it. I, I fastened it very loosely so that maybe it falls and hits me at some point. Right. <laughs> well, and to pay and to play devil's advocate just for a second, I, and kind of you know support Max's case, I will say that uh, I do agree with what he's saying in part about belief becoming reality. I mean, look at placebos, right? Placebos are a huge proof of that. That if you really believe something that it will manifest into reality. So, but I don't know yeah. if that's necessarily true so much for, you know, tangible objective things or not. But, mm -hmm. you know, and I'll leave it at that, you know. Well, they, they, some people say that's actually tangible because of the mind, mind itself being an organ of the senses. Mm -hmm. uh, it has uh, the capacity to, to at least regulate the body. So the placebo is directly related with something affecting the body's health, right? Uh, it's not... You know, you know what I'm pointing to is, is, is a particular thing that your body, uh, certain things you consume, you can actually change. And it's a whole Bruce Lipton thing, but uh, it still is, is different than the earth uh, being a ball. You know, yep. it's uh, it, the, the mind does do things, but it cannot change the world into a different shape, I don't think. Yep. I'd exactly. say if, if he's legitimate, let him come out with a good video showing the proofs of why he became, a, you know, believes in the flat earth, what changed his mind and go over those. I'd like to see some more effort that way. Cause right now I think he's, I think he's a deceiver. I hate to say it, but, uh, claiming that that event over there at that New Zealand is real that we can't name. Um, I mean, come on. Yeah. And, and the sad part is Ben, I, I can't just, I can't necessarily disagree with you. I mean, I'm hoping that isn't true, but I cannot disagree with what you're saying, you know, so. Bobby, have you, I mean, you feel like in a way that his work has helped you. That's one of the things, that's why it's tougher for you. It, yeah, and, and I don't, I know I'm not the only one. I mean, Max Egan has done, you know, he's mm -hmm. been around for as long as what well, I can remember, honestly, and he's exposed a lot of stuff. So it's really difficult to watch right. this happen, you know. Uh, and I don't know what to think. I really don't. Mm -hmm. uh, I just think, I honestly think he's kind of losing it. You know, maybe he's just getting old or something. But, you know, and, and I hate to bash on the guy, but my God, it's just preposterous what he's saying. So, yeah. you know, there you have it. Well, so you Think of all the good work Alex Jones has done. I mean, he, true. You know, he brought us yeah. a, the idea of, you know, the, the Illuminati Grove. I forget the name of it, wherever they worship. Oh, he mean Grove. Yeah, I mean, he went in there, but we never dawned on us. Maybe he was invited to go there so that he could, you know, show some genuine truths and, and, real, and reveal some genuine things going on just so he could take control of the movement. Exactly. Manage, that's what I was about to say. That, that's, what he's, that's what this Max dude seems to be doing. He's given us some truth, and that's just exactly what a gatekeeper, for lack of a better term, would do. They have to gain your trust. So when you talk about geoengineering, for example, well, that's not a, that doesn't impress me. There's there's legislation from 1973 that the government has declassified. They were interested in weather modification. So when you start to talk about the big things, you know, like is there an impending alien deception? The Earth is actually flat. We're enclosed. Things like that. These people that are touted as major truthers, they never touch on those big subjects. They just gain your trust. And then when he touches on the subject of the Earth, he just completely confuses the audience. So it's just hard for me to think it's a coincidence, but I don't know much about him, so I'm just speculating. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> again, I can't disagree with what you're saying, Austin. So <laughs> um, it's just really confusing, and um, it's unfortunate. All I can say is I hope he gets better. Let's put it that way, and uh, you know, pulls up. So, and and we'll leave it at that. So. All right, so let's move on to kind of the main uh, part of why I named the show The Etheric Science of Quantum Nothingness, and uh, hat tip to Karen B. for posting this article today. Um, but this comes from a magazine called, or a publication uh, website, sciencealert.com, 
And it is titled, In Physics, Nothingness Has Friction, and the Fastest Spinning Object Ever Made Could Measure It, right? Well, so what they've done is they say scientists have created the fastest spinning object ever made, taking them a big step closer to being able to measure the mysterious quantum forces at, at play inside of nothingness. All right, now again, here we have a bunch of doublespeak that's right up there with the idea of, you know, massless particles uh, having mass, you know, light having particles, right? It's Light is not a particle, I'm sorry. Um, it has no mass, nothing like that. This is all quantum mechanics, mumbo jumbo BS that the mainstream is absolutely pushing. And uh, it, it is a deception, it's a lie, and it is so ridiculous, you know, that people can even buy into this. It, it just boggles the mind. But so they will go on to make, um, you know, claiming, uh, make claims about, you know, how this is becoming such a big deal in, in physics. And they're saying their researchers are now comfortable with the fact that empty space isn't empty at all. Actually, it's actually full of quantum fluctuations that we're only just now learning how to detect. Well, that's a lie, first of all, but we'll go into that here in a little bit. Uh, but we're still struggling to find tools sensitive enough to measure these tiny forces at play. Now, again, this is BS, right? Um, uh, several years ago, researchers from Purdue uh, University in the U.S. took a step forward by developing a method for measuring torque or twisting force acting on tiny oblong uh, piece of diamond. And then they go on to talk about how they can spin this thing up to 300 billion uh, revolutions per second and, you know, yada, yada, yada. It's like whatever, Okay. So the link, one of the links from the science alert is to another science alert that says physicists just measured quantum nothingness at room temperature. And it's like, wow, how, how did they do that? How do you suppose they do that? Well, before I reveal that, I've talked um, over the past uh, couple months about, well, I've talked a lot longer than the past couple of months, about the existence of the luminiferous ether, okay? And this is something that science has known, all the major scientific figures have known exist um, for you know, well over 100 years, well over 100 years. Um, th there were experiments that proved it way back in the day, uh, the Michelson-Gale experiment, the Sanyak experiment, uh, Michelson-Morley, of course, that, that one, when that one interfered with their uh, agenda, let's just put it that way, then they mathematically got rid of it, right, and tried to push the Einstein, you know, relativity agenda, which is right up there with quantum mechanics nonsense, all right? So they are talking about how they were able to measure it. Well, how did they measure it, right? And it goes back once again to, you know, this etheric luminiferous ether. I'm sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit here. That, that you know, has been known for all this time. And they're just simply trying to rebrand it. You know, I've talked about how they're trying to rename this the quantum field or the Higgs field or they're putting all these different names on it. And I've got, believe me, I've got a ton of, of proof to back this up. But one of the interesting parts about here is what I've got highlighted right here. And it says, this experiment looked at a phenomenon called quantum radiation pressure, which arises when particles interact with detectors such as LIGO. Oh boy, here we go with LIGO again, all right? The Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory in the U.S. responsible for confirming the existence of gravitational waves a little over three years ago. Of course, that's been debunked uh, ad nauseum. And, of course, they just keep having to double down and double down and double down, um, you know, insisting that they can uh, detect gravitational waves that are coming from a source a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away uh, that it essentially emanates 140 million light years away, where two neutron stars or black holes came together, collided, made a huge gravitational wave that was the only thing that then the LIGO facilities were able to detect as far as a gravitational wave. Ironically, they've never been able to detect, you know, gravitational fields like the one emanating from the moon that that uh, is able to lift trillions of gallons and pounds of of seawater from the oceans, right? They, they can't detect that field. Again, they have to resort to fantasy land and another Disney, um, you know, creation, a uh, galaxy long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. All right, so here we go. 
the quantum radiation pressure becomes a type of noise that can interfere with results. But like other quantum phenomenon, we would usually need to study it at ultra cold temperatures in order to keep the particles still and figure out what's going on. But a team of researchers from Louisiana State University, a go LSU, managed to uh, actually measure this quantum effect in real-world conditions at room temperature. Yeah, no doubt we do that every day. Which is useful because it means we may now be able to apply the findings to real-world equipment. This experiment was done using miniature versions of LIGO. Uh, the full-size ones are a pair of observatories housed almost 2,000 miles apart. All right, so... What they're doing then is they are using miniature versions of LIGO. Well, what is LIGO? Let's look at LIGO. LIGO is a facility that is basically made up, and there are other, other gravitational wave observatories uh, out there, you know, supposedly, but these are their biggies. This is what found the original gravitational waves, um, supposedly, uh, which of course is nonsense. But anyway, so, what they are is they have one in Livingston, Louisiana, and one in Hanford, Washington, um, two facilities that are identical. And essentially what they are designed to do is they use um, laser interferometry, which uh, I'll, I'll go into that in a minute as to how that works. But they use laser interferometry to detect when a gravitational wave passes through. Well, what exactly is happening, you know, to cause a detection of a gravitational wave, um, you know, to say, ding, 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 you've got gravitational waves. Well, here's the way it works. You have two uh, laser beams, or you have a laser beam, okay, that is fired from a laser, okay, and it goes through a beam splitter. Now, this beam splitter is a half-silvered mirror, meaning that it's not fully silvered where it's going to completely reflect the image all the way back. It actually will allow part of that light beam to pass through, right? Okay, so when they fire the laser, um, it hits this beam splitter and one side of the beam goes this direction and the other side of the beam goes this direction. Now, what they're saying is happening is that when a gravitational wave comes through um, these facilities, and, and, and these are the, the big, long, huge tunnels, they're four kilometers long, but they're saying that when a gravitational wave comes through, it hits these detector legs simultaneously and it physically shortens them, right? How much does it shorten them? Well, about the width, uh, a thousandth of a width of a proton, right? Which in and of itself is another one of those completely absurd claims. You know, I mean, yeah, granted, laser interferometry is exceedingly accurate. But to say that it can uh, detect something that, you know, is less than a proton width, let alone a thousandth of a proton width, is ridiculous. Okay, but that's what they're saying. So they're saying that here comes the gravitational wave. It hits these arms, um, and one of these arms then becomes shorter than the other, which then uh, sets off a differential, a phase differential between these two. And bada-bing, they've got an anomaly. Well... This isn't enough. So now they have to say, well, it has to be verified by the same thing happening at both facilities up here at the Hanford Observatory, which is in Richland, Washington, as the same in Livingston, Louisiana. If they both do the same exact thing, what they will hear is a little chirp. And that chirp then tells them that a gravitational wave of sufficient magnitude has come through to set off LIGO, and you have an authentic detection. Well, what a bunch of horse manure, right? It, it just is, okay? Now, the interesting thing about this is that this, this facility is nothing more than uh, a Michelson-Morley experiment. It's as simple as that. It's a Michelson-Morley experiment, here we have exactly the same thing. Well, let's actually put these right next to each other. So let's look at this. Here's this in the two arms. And here is the Michelson-Morley experiment. Same thing. We've got a light source. It's going through a half-silvered mirror, beam splitter. Part of it goes this way. Part of it goes this way. Um, when there is a phase differential change, when it comes back, 
um, to the eyepiece or a detector in this case. There is a fringe change or a phase change. Bada bing, there it is. Okay, so let's let's let Malcolm Bowden describe exactly how this works. Um, well, actually, you know what? I think what I want to do is I want to let Sanyak let let him talk about the Sanyak experiment first because this this animation actually gives you a better idea. And you guys were talking about um, you know Aries failure, and I'm going to cover that too really quick as well. But essentially, there is something that is governing the speed of light, okay? And it is in fact this luminiferous ether medium that is doing that because under the rules of relativity, um, there it it won't matter. It, it simply can't matter. But uh, let me let Malcolm Bowden describe this really quick, and we will go forward from there. Here we go. Sanyak carried out a simple experiment of passing light in opposite directions around a table and recombining them. This produced interference fringes. He then rotated the whole table at two revolutions per second and found that the fringes changed. This result has very significant implications in science. It works as follows. A beam of light leaves the light source at the bottom left hand corner and is split into two different beams which we have colored red and blue just to distinguish them. They travel around the circuit in opposite directions until they eventually reach the splitter which also recombines them. There they then go on to the photographic plate where they have interference fringes. In this simplified version we see the beam is split into two, the red and the blue again, and they go around the circuit and are recombined at the splitter and recombining prism so that they again produce the fringes on the photographic plate. Now let us rotate the table. Before we do so, there is the very important subject of the effect of the ether. The Michelson-Morley experiment failed to detect the 30 kilometers per second motion of the Earth through the ether. So as to overcome this problem, Einstein simply abolished the ether in his relativity theory. The very significant result of the Sanyak experiment was that it proved that the ether existed. Let us see how it did this. It is a fundamental feature of relativity that it claims that as there is no ether, light travels away from a source at the same speed relative to the source, whether the source is moving or not. Thus, whether the table is turning or not, the fringe patterns should stay the same. Okay, and you can kind of think of that of, uh, say you're, uh, you're driving down the street in a car, right? And you're doing 30 miles an hour uh, in the car, and you, the car has a sunroof, and you stand up out of the, the, the sunroof. Well, if you hold the ball up in the air in your hand, well, uh, relative to the ground, the, the ball is also traveling at 30 miles an hour. Now, let's say you're a Major League Baseball uh, pitcher and you wind up and you throw a fastball in the same direction as the car is going now you've taken and and you can do a hundred mile an hour pitch right so you not only will have then that hundred mile an hour pitch that you're capable of doing you know standing still but the the baseball will actually become additive the speed of the baseball uh, of the 30 mile an hour of the car plus the pitcher's ability to toss it at 100 miles an hour, thus giving a net speed result of 130 miles an hour, right? So that would be a, an analogy that would be equivalent to the no ether relativity uh, uh, argument, okay? So just to kind of get something in your head to clarify that, so let's move on. But if the ether exists, once the light has left the source, the speed of the light is controlled by the ether, independent of the speed of the table, mirrors, etc. As we right. And the other thing that we're seeing here, and now the ether is not necessarily, it's regulating the speed, speed of the light, but to be more accurately, to be more technically accurate, it is regulating the rate of induction of the source perturbation that is actually uh, perturbating the ether that is giving us this, this wave-like behavior um, of the light beam or whatever you want to call it okay so um, and i'm not going to try and confuse you too much because that gets a little bit confusing but suffice it to say that you know what's going on here is the ether limits things to a finite speed limit regardless 
of you know whether it's moving forward or not, uh, which is uh, in stark contrast to the relativity explanation uh, up here. So let's continue on. As we see here. So let us see what happens when we rotate the table. Here, the light is split, and the red and blue lights go in opposite directions. But notice that the left-hand mirror has moved around in such a direction that the distance the red light has to travel is further. Now, in relativity, the same time should be taken because the splitter is also moving and the distance between them is the same. But, now imagine that the ether exists and the speed of the light is controlled by the stationary ether. Imagine the ether like a thick treacle that limits how fast the light can travel independent of the motion of the light source, the splitter or the mirrors. The result is that the red light takes longer to reach the left-hand mirror. Similarly, the right-hand mirror is coming towards the blue light, so it reaches the mirror quicker. After they change ends, the red light again takes longer to reach the recombiner, whilst the blue light gets there quicker again. So they reach the photographic plate with a delay between them, and this changes the fringe pattern. In fact, Sanyak, using the speed of the rotation of the table, calculated how much the fringes should change, and found that they did change by just that amount. The crucial feature of this experiment is that it demonstrates that the ether does exist, which demolishes relativity. Yes, it does. Okay, so now, how do we know that this isn't just a bunch of nonsense, right? Well, we know it because we have existing technology that works uh, based on the Sanyak effect. And, you know, it's none other than the famous fiber optic gyro or ring laser gyro, you know, that, that I have been credited with proving the rotation of the Earth with, right? Well, I'm not going to explain again why we have been able to debunk that, but suffice it to say that we have. But the more important thing is that without this existence of the luminiferous ether, the Sanyak effect could not work. And if it could not work, then we could not have uh, inertial nav navigation systems and inertial reference systems like that use the fiber optic and ring laser gyro. Okay? They, they are absolutely a, an integral part um, that, that encompasses this experiment that was done uh, and some people don't like to call it an experiment, whatever. Um, this, this observation, if you will, that was done over 100 years ago. All right, It's real. The ether is real. And there's many, many, many more ways to prove it. And it is only nowadays that they're trying to integrate this ether into some sort of a quantum effect of nothingness, which is, again, absurd. All right, so now let's go over and let's look at why they wanted to eliminate the luminiferous ether. Um, and again, mind you, when the Michelson-Gale experiment was done and the Sanyak, um, and it detected this 15 degree per hour rotation uh, of the ether around the Earth, um, you have to wonder why didn't science at that time say, hey, look at this Michelson-Gale experiment and the Sanyak experiment. It proves that there's this rotation uh, ether. Actually, it's Michelson-Gale, not the Sanyak. But the Michelson-Gale uh, that is proving this 15 degree per hour rotation, well, you're about to find out why they don't stick to that. And that then comes to, not that one, oh, crap, let me find it, uh, the Michelson-Morley experiment. So let's, let's find out how that works. Here we go. In 1887, Michelson and Morley carried out an experiment to check this speed of the Earth through the ether. They passed light through two long arms, one in the direction of the Earth's travel, and the other at right angles to it. The light traveling in the direction of the Earth's travel should have taken longer to return than that traveling at right angles to the Earth's direction of travel. To the amazement of the scientific world, no such speed as 30 kilometers per second was detected. But they did get speeds between 1 and 10 kilometers per second. Okay, now you have to ask yourself, why would they have gotten speeds between 1 and 10 kilometers per second? I'll tell you why. Because in this apparatus, remember, the ether has been known, these characteristics have been known that it is rotating in a vortexual matter, manner, okay? And, again, the other thing you have to ask yourself is if this 
is the same as this, then why is it that, that the LIGO facility is not suffering from this same Lorentz contraction problem and going off all the time, right? Because both detectors would be going off all the time, um, saying, oh, shortening, shortening, shortening because of the Earth motion, motion uh, especially during aphelion and perihelion when the Earth would technically be changing velocities, right, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but yet, ironically, nope, doesn't happen, right? <laughs> Crazy stuff. And the other thing that, that you have to ask yourself why it doesn't happen is, uh, again, if, if the moon, and I said this a minute ago, if the, if the moon is... Uh, no. Okay, Iru? Iru, you're, you're, you're sorry, 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 guys, sorry. Okay, so if the moon is generating this huge gravitational field, why isn't LIGO able to pick it up? And if it is outside, uh, even if this enormous gravitational uh, power of the moon that's lifting up trillions of tons of the Earth's oceans, right? If that is outside of the detection threshold of the gravitational detection capabilities of LIGO, then why, when the two black holes came together and traveled, you know, 1.4 million light years and came across the LIGO facilities, why didn't all hell break loose on Earth? Right, because my God, if it's strong, it's if it's stronger than the moon's pole, you would have thought that there would have been some unbelievable manifestations um, that would have happened besides LIGO going off. Right? Well, it didn't. Why? Because it's all bullshit. That's why. All right. So let's continue on uh, with Malcolm's explanation here. Ignoring these speeds, this experiment is always referred to as giving a null result. This shook the scientific world, and to overcome the implication that the Earth was stationary, they invented the Fitzgerald Lorenz contraction. This claimed that the arm that was in the direction of the Earth's travel became shorter, so that the time to return was the same as in the other arm. There was absolutely no justification for such a solution. It was only invented to overcome the idea that the Earth was stationary in the ether. As Arthur Miller stated, this invention of the Fitzgerald-Lorenz contraction was a physics of desperation. So troubling was this to scientists that eventually Einstein produced his relativity theory by which he overcame the problem by simply abolishing the ether. Right, mathematically through the Lorenz contraction. And that is exactly what happened. But what's so funny is Einstein himself absolutely admitted that that you know the, the world not having ether in the world is is unthinkable and in fact let me let me go um to this particular quote um and let's listen to this for just a second uh, hat tip to odu pick you up for this uh, little sound bite here we go zero the stage was set for one of the most important events in the history of physics the michelson morley experiment 1887 Michelson Morley experiment. If the Earth were moving through an ether, then a sort of ether wind would be created at the surface of the Earth. A light beam projected directly into this ether wind would be expected to move slower than a light beam projected across the ether wind. Okay, and this is this actually is not the quote that I was looking for, but you know what? This is a better explanation of Michelson Morley taken from the movie The Principal, and we are using this under fair use. So let's go ahead and, and let them kind of describe it here, because uh, this is really important to understand this. You know, the difference between Michelson Gale and Michelson Morley, and why, instead of claiming the Michelson Gale experiment proved Earth rotation, why they had to discredit Michelson Morley. Let's continue on. If we project the beams across a known distance and then recombine them, we would expect the two waves to be out of phase by an amount that would tell us the distance the Earth had moved. If the Earth is moving through the ether, then light waves going one direction relative to us should travel at a different speed than another direction. It's like if you're in a fast moving river and you're swimming along with the current, you're swimming much faster relative to the shore than if you are if you're swimming against the current. So what the Michelson-Morley experiment was designed to do was measure the speed of light in one direction versus another direction to see how fast we're moving through the ether. And what it discovered was it's the same in one direction as the other. Michelson-Morley couldn't measure any effect of Earth's orbit 
even though the assumption was at the time that that would affect uh, the uh, measured speed of light. This conclusion directly contradicts the explanation which presupposes that the Earth The moves. experiment failed to detect the Earth moving in or against the ether. The problem was serious. Yeah, buddy. Although various solutions were advanced, in the end, science was faced with a choice. Either discard the ether or admit that the Earth wasn't orbiting the sun. And that is exactly why they had to discard the ether, right? Um, <laughs> which is funny because, again, without the ether, the Sanyak effect simply could not work, okay? So, um, was it this one? Let me uh, see. Oh, okay. So, and I realize I'm jumping around. I probably should have written this down a little bit better. But um, what they did then is, you know, after the Mickelson-Gale experiment detected this rotation of the ether of 15 degrees per hour, okay, they're like saying, okay, so how do we differentiate um, and tell whether or not it is the ether moving around us at 15 degrees per hour or if it is the earth rotating underneath the earth, uh, underneath the ether uh, at 15 degrees per hour, okay? Well, that's a really good question. And the answer, and we talked about this on Friday, guys, you were asking about this on Friday, about Aries failure. And this is exactly the simple methodology that was devised to tell which was which. Okay, so let's listen to this really quick. Here we go. In 1729, Bradley found that he had to tip his telescope forward very slightly to get a star in the center of his telescope. It was assumed that this was due to the motion of the Earth around the Sun. Let us assume that the telescope was moving at 5 mile an hour and had to be tipped 5 degrees. This 5 degree tipping, however, could equally be caused by the ether moving at 5 mile an hour carrying the stars around the Earth. As we see here, the light would be coming in at the same angle and the telescope would still have to be tipped 5 degrees. So tipping the telescope does not tell us whether it is the starlight moving or the telescope moving. However, there is a simple experiment that can determine whether it was the Earth that was moving or the ether and starlight. All that you had to do was record the tipping required for any particular star, then fill the telescope with water, which greatly slows down the speed of light in the telescope. So here is the moving telescope filled with water, tipped at 5 degrees, and you can see that the starlight does not now reach the eyepiece at the bottom. This is because the starlight moves much more slowly when passing through water. However, if the telescope is tipped further, say 10 degrees, then the starlight will then be visible again in the eyepiece. It has to be tipped further because the light is now slower when in the telescope. But if the starlight is going past the telescope at 5 mile an hour, then when it is filled with water, no t further tipping is needed because the light is coming in at 5 degrees anyway. The starlight stays on the same path, but is only travelling slower in the water. To recap, if it is the telescope that is moving, then when it is filled with water, it has to be tipped further to see the star. If the telescope is stationary and the starlight drifting past us, then it does not have to be tipped further. In 1871, George Biddle Airy, the Astronomer Royal, performed this experiment. This is a copy from his original report. You can see that the two readings are virtually identical. If it had been the telescope that was moving, Airy expected a figure of 30 seconds of arc. In fact, he only managed to read 0.8 seconds of arc difference. Bradley first discovered stellar aberration, and it is interesting that in his report, Airy mentions that it was now about 100 seconds of arc, and that it was still slowly diminishing. This indicates that 
the speed of light was still decreasing in measurable amounts when Airy performed his experiment in 1871. The result of Airy's experiment, known as Airy's failure, was that the telescope does not have to be tipped further. This proved that it was the incoming light that was moving past a stationary telescope fixed to the stationary Earth. What is interesting in his very brief report of only four pages is that not once did he refer to the astonishing results that the experiment proved, that the Earth was stationary. This experiment was also dismissed by Wikipedia, which said, Ether drag test. Okay, so there you have it. A very, very simple way to, to test it. And, you know, as we showed a minute ago, um, it, the luminiferous ether is rotating around at the same velocity, roughly, as the stars, or a sidereal day, right? Not a solar day, but a sidereal day. Um, and they're both very, very close to 15 degrees per hour, because I think there's only like something like four minutes difference between a solar and a sidereal day. All right, so it's very, very difficult to ascertain which is which. Okay, so along comes um, the, the fiber optic gyro, which when we were doing our measurements, and you know, much to our surprise, when we turned that thing on, what was it detecting? Well, it detected roughly 15 degree per hour rotation. Well, what was that? It was the luminiferous ether. Now, we in FE Core figured out another way to prove that it was the luminiferous ether, um, and I've I've just des I've described this before in the elevation changes, um, because if the and this is the reason, by the way, also that the starlight um, has a different rotational rate than the sun. They, I mean, they're they're different. They're actually at different levels to some degree, but the bottom line is, is that if you are on a Earth that is rotating, then that 15 degree per hour rotation rate is never going to change. And it's also going to be exactly at a solar day rate. Well, it turns out that the rotation rate being picked up by the fiber optic gyro is closer to the sidereal day rate. Um, and it also changed with uh, elevation change on the exact same latitude, which of course is not commensurate with the ball model at all. So the bottom line is, all I'm saying here, guys, is that the ether exists. And it is because of that, it is because of laser interferometry that science is trying to scramble to come up with another explanation of how light is propagating and stuff like that. And so what they're then doing is they are making up ridiculous things, uh, ridiculous little stories, calling it nothingness has friction, and the title of this, Physical's Just Measured Quantum Nothingness. No, it's not quantum nothingness. And isn't it interesting that what they're using to measure this quantum nothingness is exactly the same inter laser interferometry technology that Mickelson Morley is using, LIGO is using, and they're saying that, oh, wow, they're just now figuring out how to measure this? I don't think so. This is a blatant lie. People, we've had this technology for over 100 years, but this just shows, like as Malcolm uh, Bowden says, a physics of desperation. They cannot, under any circumstances, allow the so-called luminiferous ether to exist, and so they are trying to disguise it by integrated in, uh, integrating it into their bean-counting quantum nonsense model of quantum mechanics, all right? So, any comments on this? And Austin, I'm sure you probably have a few things to say about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you did a really good job of explaining it because uh, it's really it can be it can get overcomplicated. I, I think it's really pretty simple. But um, yeah, I, I saw another article where they squeezed pure nothingness. I mean, very simply, I just think it's absurd. How long are we going to go along where we're we're doing things to nothing? Can, can we just acknowledge what's there and, and then we can explain observable phenomena? You know, like uh, when they shot the laser through the test, I believe it was a university in Germany, shot a laser through a, a vacuum chamber and they had to come up with this, this phrase, squeeze pure nothingness in quantum fields. And um, it's very simple. Light is an ether perturbation, like you were saying. And technically it's a rate of induction. It doesn't, it doesn't travel, but so, um, you know, it's not a photon traveling from one place to the other. And uh, I think that 
maybe people will listen to to you more so than me because I'm just in college dropout, you know. But maybe I'm wrong here. Maybe you can tell me tell me what I'm missing. But but as simple as when say a laser goes through the water, like we were looking at the telescope, and it slows down, and then when it exits, it speeds back up. Well, that would breach the the uh, law of conservation of energy if it is actually a physical photon traveling from point A to point B. But if we understand it's just an ether perturbation, we have no no issues. So um, I, don't, I don't know. Basically, just I just think it's real simple. It's pretty obvious the ether's there. It explains everything. And all quantum mechanics and quantum physics is doing is running around trying to to figure it out without the proper base uh, presumptions. You know, so it's it's a futile pursuit. Right. And, and you're absolutely right about that because, um, and, and you're right in your, your assumption also, I mean, light cannot go through a medium, slow down and, and then speed back up without breaking some laws of physics. It just simply cannot happen. Okay. So, um, yeah, they're trying to integrate it into this, you know, quantum nonsense, um, where if they can't bean count it, then it doesn't exist. And that's, you know, that's the position of a lot of people. They're saying, well, this is something you can't physically, you know, quantitatively, uh, you know, measure, um, and, and granted, maybe you can't quantitatively measure the, the ether itself, but you can measure its effects, right? Kind of, kind of like, you know, its whole relationship to gravity, right? You can't necessarily figure out the source, but you can draw analogies. You can drop microphones on the ground and say, yeah, that's gravity or whatever. Um, but the, the, the main point behind that is, is that there is an acceleration and it is being created by something, okay? And I'm not going to go too far down that road because that just opens a, a big can of worms for a lot of people. But this is they're all related, guys. Electromagnetism, electricity, gravity, the etheric field, they're, they're all very much related. And it is very difficult. It's exceedingly difficult to, um, you know, do experiments and separate them and to try and quantify them makes it even more difficult. Again, you can measure effects. You can say, okay, things fall at a, a rate of 9.8 meters per second squared, yada, yada, yada. Um, and that's all fine and dandy. But, you know, again, where the mainstream has gone off the rails, then is they take this into physics la-la land, you know, with mathematical constructs, making huge assumptions with no proof whatsoever um, saying things like, well, yeah, the ISS can then fall around the Earth because it's being pulled by the gravity. But even that has a huge problem. Uh, again, if if the rate of gravity acceleration is increasing exponentially, then you would think logic would dictate that the ISS would also have to be increasing speed exponentially. But that doesn't happen. All right? So, again, nobody is I disputing. A, I just want to make. Oh, sure. I just I just want to make a couple of points, and I just want to re 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 excuse me reiterate what you said before. Think of all the problems of the LIGO system, of the gravitational pulls of the sun and the moon, where the, you know sometimes they're aligned, sometimes they're not, sometimes they're opposite of LIGO, sometimes they're on the other side. I mean, what considerations do they have for that? I mean, the idea that the special gravity just happens to come on these waves come from these black holes or whatever, and and that's the only thing that can detect it. But the, the sun and the moon are irrelevant. And the, the second point I wanted to make was the, each leg of that LIGO system is, is, is four kilometers or two and a half miles long. That's a four-foot drop in curvature. Did, did they take that into account when they built that? Did they, they, when I look at the pictures, they look like they're just built on the ground. Did they try, make a four-foot adjustment for the curvature of the Earth, or did they leave it perfectly straight? And it just so happens it was built on ground that was magically – uh, you know, automatically curved for the four feet. I, you know, just some other questions to uh, have. <laughs> Those are great questions, Ben. And, and, and oh, also, ahead, awesome. Bob, uh, oh. Rod, but also uh, another thing that's telling, at least for me, is that, it, as you mentioned, is a really big Michelson-Morley experiment that they have. And they talk about gravitational waves, but they don't talk about Earth's rotation. Right. Right. Well, right. The whole idea of the Michelson-Morley experiment in the first place was to measure a 30 kilometer per second or a 67,000 mile per hour velocity around the sun. The problem is, is it didn't detect it, and that's what caused the shitstorm. <laughs> so, and another so, thing is, like the the ether um, is rotating. So, like you're saying, because you 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 you're talking about measuring the flux of the its flow sort of in the in, in the differences in altitude and so on in the electric ring gyro 
but then uh, we when when the other guy the geocentrist was talking talking he was saying that the ether creates this kind of static almost like a static frame of reference which was what was what was being picked up by the gyro as well so it so but it's not necessarily static yes. it is almost it's, static that's key almost is the big word there it's okay. it's not quite static especially in comparison to a 30 kilometer per second the ether is moving just very very slowly got it so there you have it okay but yeah i mean great points and you know that's the whole thing and this is why uh this whole you know this whole debate around um the ether is it is so critical for them to have to uh, uh, eliminate it and yet every proof in the book every time you turn around it's proven it's proven it's proven well finally science got to the point where they're saying well we better come up with another terminology so we can explain this um, and we're going to call it some sort of a quantum effect. Um, and then as long as, and, and we're going to say then also that it agrees perfectly with uh, 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 Einstein's relativity theory. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play another really quick clip here. This is kind of cool, too. And this is from the uh, Greg Braden documentary. So this is for fair use, under fair use for commentary and criticism. And they've also taken this down, so hopefully they won't strike us on this but uh since we're not monetized i don't really give a crap about copyright claims anymore so let's listen to what uh, uh greg braden says about this um initially and let's go forward from there here we go in 1902 the nobel prize winner hendrik lorentz developed the equations that gave einstein the tools to develop his theory of relativity lorentz's equations believed that the ether field exists. And he said, and this is a quote as well, I cannot but regard the ether, which can be the seat of an electromagnetic field with its energy and its vibrations, however different it may be from all ordinary matter." End of quote. Einstein, he believed in this field as well, but he's described it in a very, very different way. He said simply, space without ether is unthinkable. That is the quote I was looking for earlier. Einstein himself saying space without the ether is unthinkable. And yet um, he was forced by his handlers essentially to, um, you know, expand on the Lorentz contraction, which, you know, said basically, that, and with no experimental evidence whatsoever, that things, you know, when they're going against the ether, the ether just shortens them up physically, right? By this this rate of, uh, you know, a few thousandths of a, a width of a proton, absolutely preposterous. So the point that I'm making with all of this is the sense in the scientific community that there's something out there that fills what we think of as empty space. It has been accepted for a very, very long time until recently. It's unacceptable today, and I'll tell you, if you want to clear a room full of scientists at a scientific conference, begin your, your presentation by saying, today I'm going to talk about the ether field, and you'll see them get up and leave the room. <laughs> Boy, that is absolutely true too, right? Why? Because this is the only thing that is being taught in the mainstream. Um, is that, you know, the ether can exist, Einstein relativity is the know-all. This is the reason why you get people like George Mooser coming out and saying, uh, well, gravity isn't a force, but you can think of it as a force. It's it, No, he's saying that because he has to push the Einstein agenda of gravity being bendy space-time, right? So they always have to distort, you know, known physics that works very well um, to fit this, you know, this paradigm of Einstein and his nonsense uh, special relativity theory. The term is not even used today, although the field itself is now being validated. Well, in 1887, physicist Albert Michelson and chemist Edward Morley, they attempted for the first time to describe once and for all if this mysterious field actually exists. This is the very famous Michelson-Morley experiment that I mentioned in the last episode. It was performed in the basement of Case Western Reserve University in Ohio in the United States in a very nondescript building where they built a device that is called an interferometer. Now the image that you're seeing on your screen is the interferometer and I'd like to take just a few moments and explain to you what it is that they were doing and what it is that this experiment revealed. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you're seeing a... 
Okay, so we will skip forward from that because he's basically going to describe it, right? Um, and let's get to where he kind of goes to a conclusion. Everywhere all the time, and they believed that the field is in motion. They believed it's moving. And so their thinking was that when they shoot a beam of light through this field, if the beam parallels the movement of the field, it's going to move quicker and it will be unimpeded. If the beam is perpendicular and it has to move through this field, it's going to be slowed down just a little bit. And when that beam is reunited with the original beam, Okay, so basically he's just going through and describing it. But, and this is something that I don't want to play too much of this. And again, this is for commentary and criticism. And we are using this under fair use because I know Gaia.com does not take kindly to people using their stuff. But, hey, there are fair use laws and, and we are using it or such. Uh, I will make this available, this link uh, to this documentary, because it is quite exceptional. And towards the end of this documentary, Greg goes into all the evidence he goes into many many more cases than i have about how science is changing names of this field this etheric field uh the, the quantum field the, the the higgs field yada 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 i mean it goes on and on and on and plus you know i have shown many many uh, uh scholarly papers that that are showing just that you know they're simply rebranding the luminiferous ether because they they have to avoid it like the plague because the big thing that that happened with it is that it simply debunked, hands down, the 30 kilometers per second motion of the Earth around the sun. All right, and that's that. So let's move on, because uh, we are starting to run a little short on time. Um, next thing I want to address is this clown. <laughs> now, I don't know how many people saw this, and actually, oh I'm, this, was, this is so bad, you guys. This guy right here is a baller troll by the name of Team Skeptic. He is one of the trolls that was that showed up at Flat Earth International Conference and was starting crap with everybody, you know, knocking Nathan Thompson's hat off of his head. I mean, the guy is a complete moron. I I, I don't even know the ballers. If I were the if I was a baller, I would throw him so far out of the community after this performance. I mean, he. I don't even know how to describe his actions. He was so triggered from the very get-go. Um, he started screaming. He was using ad homs. He was, you know, All just... All cursing, cursing nonstop. Um, oh, my God. It was horrible. Embarrassing. <laughs> embarrassing to watch, almost. Like, I made a comment. I took it out later. I saw there's so many comments on the video. But I was almost embarrassed to have watched it. And Nathan held on so well. And then at some point, he started to to shoot uh, back, which was funny. But, uh, yeah, it was fun. But I it got me kind of sweating at night when I was watching. I was like, oh, my goodness, how can this guy be so triggered, so dumb at the same time? And, wow, it's – yeah, I don't know if you want to play it. but No, I'm not going to gonna go play much of it. I will put the two show links. <laughs> um, Flat Earth Millionaire uh, actually was there. And I don't want to use the other guys because they, they did this pay-per-view. And they'll probably – and they're a bunch of Globers too, by the way. Yeah, uh, I saw you know, it in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of the first things that, that happened, of course, when Nathan started making his original, his opening uh, argument is they started firing up these tattoo guns, you know, and you get this in the background yeah, and stuff. What was that? It was it, so annoying. Yeah, that. And they were just, they were just trolling. They were trying to just be, be as drip, disruptive as they can to him. And, you know, what's funny is when Nathan would make a very sound and solid point, um, this guy would get so unbelievably triggered, like, watch, well, just look at his reactions. And, you know, when you actually play it, he just, he starts, he starts, you know, ad hominem and calling him names and, uh -huh. and getting up and he starts walking around all over the place. He can't even sit still. And uh, it, it, it's just comical. No, he asks a question. He says, and uh, Nathan says one word and then he interrupts and again and then again. It's it's incredible, like that the host. I thought it was bad form on the host mm. not actually stopping it early enough because it was really annoying. Uh, but he did actually shut him up at some point, and it was it was kind of it was funny to watch the guy being. It was humiliating for the this guy, whoever he is. 
Yeah, yeah, Team Skeppity. I mean, and Nathan was just, Nathan very much kept his cool. A couple of times he got irritated, but my God, how, who could blame him? <laughs> yeah, <it was laughs> I'm sorry, Jaren? No, I yeah. said, how could he, it was hard to watch. Yeah, it really was. I mean, and you could just see how triggered he's in. And Nathan's just, just <laughs> sitting there looking at him like, what is your problem, dude? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he's all decked out in his little team skeptic uniform, and he's you know he's really cool and everything. He brings a bell. He brings a little bell to ring. Like what? Is <laughs> yeah. Oh. What was that? He rang the bell. It's so pathetic. That's, that's and then annoying. look at the moderator. The moderator, when this guy's losing his cool and completely going off, you know, he's just sitting there like I I don't even <laughs> I don't even know what to say. This is so bad. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like so, we live time got to watch the moderator become a flat earther. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. I know. And some of the explanations, oh my God, that, that Team Skeptic used was, well, first of all, one of the first things he said was, was so we got Bob Noodle, and Bob Noodle, here he is proving that the earth rotates. <laughs> and again, anybody that knows that the, I hadn't even touched the, the fiber optic gyro when the when the uh, movie Behind the Curve had come out, I was simply reporting on what another guy had done. Uh, I had nothing to do with it. You know, I'm saying, like, these are the results. Yeah, it's kind of embarrassing. What do we do? Um, yada, yada. And then we figured it all out, of course, and, and since went on to prove it. But the ballers, once again, he makes this part of his case. And he actually says, yeah, here's Bob Noodle proving the ether. And, and there's our case. And, you know, I still haven't gotten my, my, my Nobel Prize for that or anything like that. But then he goes on and he he starts using examples like the uh, uh, butane uh, rising things from up behind the uh, supposed curvature of the Earth, and as he so astutely pointed out, well, sorry, but the atmosphere isn't made out of butane, and nor has there any atmospheric condition that could ever possibly cause it to refract and, and, like and that. Butane and butane under I don't know how many degrees under zero because it was freezing point. <laughs> So, yeah. So, and Nathan, of course, was firing back. He was showing the pictures of Canago and, you know, very calm and collective. And, and as soon as he started doing that, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, well, the, the, what was the refractive? What was the temperature? You can't prove any of that. You're just making all these ridiculous assertions. I mean, I, I, I honestly, I don't like to watch, you know, these kind of things, you know, to be honest with you, because, you know, they just sit there and try and make a mockery. But this guy, did such an exceptional job of making a complete ass out of himself that I found it entertaining as hell. And I've watched it three times now, guys. So I'm telling you, watch this debate, please. It is epic. Sir, it's, it's flat earth recruitment. <laughs> it is. Man, if you don't walk away from this thinking the ballers are complete morons, there's something wrong with you. But this is, yeah, this is one of their main guys, you know? And it is wow, just geez. comical. <laughs> really, I, he was like, he was like you know, uh, appeasing to the authority of Red's rhetoric and stuff when he did the experiment. <laughs> and he was contradicting himself. He was saying, you didn't do the observations to Nathan. And then he was relying on Red's rhetoric observation, whereas in fact, Nathan had made his observations. Right? Yes. He had gone and yeah, so they're so embarrassing. And he just kept on calling him names uh, and getting triggered like that. It was just... Wow, I don't know how they do it. It's that's the thing. That's why the idea of space crack is it makes sense. Unfortunately, you know, yep. they're on space crack, and he knew he was getting owned at every at every turn, and that's why he just kept getting more and more and more triggered. And it's funny because you got Grant, you got Grant Phillips over here, you know, uh, asking, and, and the and the flat earthers in general, right? It's like why do we see the same stars every night? And and Team Skeptic goes off into this completely nebulous, ridiculous explanation that ultimately was so non sequitur, it made no sense whatsoever. You know, he was just throwing out the word salad, you know, hoping people were going to go, wow, what an amazingly smart guy this guy is, you know? And I'm sure there were people that actually thought that too. And uh, this guy, T. Stu, um, I don't, I don't forgot what the T stands for, but uh, T. Stu, who is a flat earth millionaire. And by the way, he's the guy also that has like either a one or $200,000 challenge, you know, out there. And it's funny because by the way, he, when he made that challenge, he actually went to the bank and freaking withdrew the money. 
And, and they didn't have 200 grand cash, so he had to do a cashier's check. But regardless, he proved that he's got it, right? So he's another one of those people that, that are doing these, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars ballers. If you can prove it, you got 200 grand from that guy. And believe me, he's got it. <laughs> so, wow. yeah, just absolutely amazing. But to watch this guy get triggered is the funniest thing I have ever seen in my life. And uh, I, I highly recommend these videos. You, I mean, like I said, I have watched them three times and I never watch crap like this. But I just, I, I was so amused by it. Uh, yeah. At some point, I was actually fast forwarding what he was saying just to see what would happen at the because I, I kind of got tired when he was answering questions. Uh, you know, I just couldn't, it was such mumbo jumbo. I was like, okay, I heard this before. I, he's on repeat, and I was just kind of <laughs> seeing what was the next, next question. Cause, look at this look. Look, look at this look, look on the moderator's face. <laughs> he's like, I'm not here. I, I don't even, I, I don't even want to, I'm not here. I would be so embarrassed. Uh, and even in the comments, when you look at the comments, you know, it's like even the ballers acknowledge that this guy completely hosed it up. And, uh, yeah, amazing. So Nathan, Nathan says at some point, like, stop interrupting while I dismantle your globe religion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what do you think of it, Jaren? I mean, I'm sure you watched all or part of it. Yeah, no, I thought it was great. I mean, Nathan always holds his own, and this guy just was uh, he triggered is the best word for it. And I don't think I would have done as good as Nathan. I think he does an awesome job. Uh, you know, I can't stand to hear people like that, just you know, screaming and yelling and getting upset and frustrated. And hey, I get it. We've all been lied to. You know, we we've all had to dissect that and and come to terms with it. But uh, these guys just refuse to to see it and will keep spitting their their same propaganda over and over again. I'm sure they seem to see the same thing from our side or they think the same thing. But obviously one person in this held their composure and the other person uh, looked like they were losing their mind. Yeah, he had nothing. He had absolutely nothing to bring the debate uh, except ad hoc. I mean, like I said, very first thing out of the box, oh, Bob Noodle proved it. It's like, I was like, yeah, he had to, you know, even make fun of my name, right? Oh, Bob Noodle did it. Bob Noodle did it. It's like, yeah, okay, yeah, you're really, you're really insulting me. Like, I haven't heard that my whole life, right? Uh, ever since I was on the playground in first grade, you know? So that just goes to show the mindset and the mentality of these guys. They are so <laughs> pathetic. Uh, but, yeah. So, anyway, uh, um, kudos to you, Nathan that's Thompson, better buddy. Than, uh, that's better than some of the alternatives I hear for my name, bro. Oh yeah, I can imagine. Or uh, mine, I, or yours. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, the Globers get very creative. You know, when they when they have to make up their ad homes, because let's face it, they got nothing. They got no argument. We have all the proof. We have all the evidence. We have all the experiments. All they have is appeal to authority, ad hominem attacks, lines of utter bullshit, um, and unprovable claims. You know, like and, and and demonstrations like soundly, which are beyond a joke, and uh, yeah, and, and oh yeah, go check out Red's rhetoric. That's that proves everything. We did all this ourselves, and yeah. So again, you know, hat tip to Nathan uh, Thompson, buddy. You did a great job, and uh, it, you know, not even so much on your. I mean, you did a great job on your performance, but what you did that was masterful was trigger this guy into oblivion. <laughs> <laughs> It was funny as hell. All right, cool. <laughs> All right, any other comments before I move on from this? Because I don't really want to give uh, Team Skeptic too much too much press. But other than he is an utter moron. But uh, any other comments? <laughs> I just wanted to add that he did represent the Globe Zealots very well. Very well. <laughs> I, I experience that every day on my channel. Every day, the nonsense, the gibberish, the appeal to to authority and conformity. I mean, I, I just thought it's like, it, that's why it makes me sick is I just can't stand those people anymore, those <laughs> comments. And he represented them perfectly. So th kudos to yeah. Team Skeptic for representing your nutcase jobs. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Team Skeptic. I can't, I can't people like that. I, I used to deal with it. I used to engage with them. But, it, you know, after three years of that, you just realize, what am I doing? This is just talk about, you know, sending your energy in the wrong way or, or letting somebody bring you down. That's exactly what people do. So it's easier sometimes just to 
ignore them. So I always give big props and, and kudos to anybody who can stand up to it because it is good for people to see. <laughs> if anything, it's, it's, a, it's a great exposition of exactly what these guys are like. Yeah. And yeah. when you're just and then when you're a random piece of dust floating in, in the endless vacuum, uh, it doesn't surprise me that you end up being that kind of person. Yeah. Yeah, they do tend to mimic each other's uh, uh, behavior, that's for sure. But, uh, yeah, wonderful. So, yeah, but all right. Jaren, remember that, that, that point of dust floating in outer space suddenly, someday, become a planet. <laughs> a planet of eventually it will, kind of guys <laughs> it will gather no the nice thing is that uh, uh i i didn't see this uh debate so i know uh, what i'm gonna see uh, after this show well, uh, you're gonna it's comedy good. gold here you gotta see it <laughs> oh uh, no amazing amazing <laughs> yeah it deserves a, like a best of kind of thing i, I was thinking about it it inspired me Yep. Yeah. If Flat Earthers had a DFOTY uh, award, Team Skeptic would definitely get it for sure. I mean, <laughs> awesome job. And the guy, the guy in the middle is the moderate, the moderator. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know. Chatting, he, he's chatting via Facebook and trying to get away from that situation. Yeah. Oh, I know. And he was like the like worst he, moderator. Yeah, you know, he he just he let this guy go off on these tangents and make a fool out of himself, and it's like, dude, save your buddy here, man. Interrupt, interject, do something, but don't let him do this because he is making himself look like a complete idiot. Uh, but he just let him roll, you know. So maybe he's a flat earther, you know. Who knows? <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, let's get away from this clown. Um, but, uh, th that was great entertainment. Wonderful entertainment. All right. So, uh, what else do I have? Oh, I know what I wanted to show you guys. Um, a lot of people, you know, David Weiss did a, you know, thing where we're talking about, uh, you know, everything being balloons and, and how we've talked about several times, all the satellites are on balloons and, and all this. And I saw this on Facebook, and this is really cool. Uh, I had actually seen it before, but they published it on Facebook. And I will put this in the show links. But I just wanted to play a couple minutes of this. Uh, and this is basically uh, Google and talking about their Loon project. Um, and I don't know if you guys have seen this or not, but I mean, talk about put it away, right? Because they're talking about how they have to go all, these, all through these rigmaroles to get um, internet and other services, right, to these, these obscure corners of the earth. And, you know, all the things, you know, all the manufacturing that they had to go through, yada, yada, yada. And you just have to ask yourself, why would they do this, right? Here's the underlying question you need to keep in your mind. Why would they do this if a single satellite could cover a half of a globe at a time, right? Why? So, um, yeah, let's... Yeah, the uh, Himawari 8, right, that camera... And ruler is miles Oops. away and you can clearly see half the earth they say so couldn't you just put a satellite right there and it could do all the work for you how dare you <laughs> how dare you <laughs> all right so let's listen to a couple minutes of this this is great in rural areas the infrastructure you would need for a terrestrial network is whoops we're going to refresh here. Hang on a second. It's like when you keep a page on, on hold for so long, unless you actually refresh it, like I'm going to have to do, it doesn't play too well. All right, now let's try it again. In rural areas, the infrastructure you would need for a terrestrial network is sometimes not economical. You would need to connect cell phone towers hundreds or thousands of kilometers over mountains or potentially crossing rivers and seas. Loon has decided to take a terrestrial infrastructure and sort of lift it up to the stratosphere. Taking the most essential components, that is the antennas, and putting them on a balloon. In 2013, we did our first proof of concept test in New Zealand. A lot of the equipment was early prototype. It certainly was not a solution that you could scale up to millions of people. After the New Zealand experiment, we focused now on a scalable, deployable, uh, worldwide solution. 
First, we needed a very reliable and robust high throughput link to the existing internet. We beam that signal up to the balloon through ground stations where the terrestrial internet network sort of ends and loon starts, connecting the telcos up to the balloon. The balloon is not stationary, it's actually moving across the sky, so you need your antennas to be tracking that balloon continually and to be a high throughput reliable link. Once you get the data from the ground station up into the balloon, you need to connect multiple balloons in a chain in order to get the signal to where it needs to go sometimes hundreds or thousands of kilometers away from the ground station. So the balloon-to-balloon -balloon links are a really critical element of the loon network. You can't string fiber between balloons, so the next best thing is to just beam the signal using lasers. You have these two free-floating platforms that are kind of swaying and bobbing uh, freely. A dance, if you will, between the two balloons where the two lasers are trying to keep the beams uh, locked onto each other. Um, as they drift in the sky. Everything has to be so precise and well aligned to be able to provide reliable and robust connections. We've established gigabit per second connectivity between the balloons up in the stratosphere, hundreds of kilometers apart. Getting the signal down to the user, we're using LTE. So you could just use the same mobile devices used today to get service whenever there's a loon balloon floating by. All of this technology coming together will ultimately allow someone who could be thousands of kilometers away from the nearest ground infrastructure to have access to the internet. balloon to provide real continuous coverage. We're just transferring the signal from one balloon to the next as they pass over a, a stationary recipient. And so by having this continuous flow, we're always filling in the area that we need to provide the service to. And by the way, guys, um, it's been over three years since Jaron and I first talked about, you know, how this could be possible to do this via balloons. And I was talking about how you could have interlinks in between the balloons, uh, essentially repeater stations. Um, and <laughs> ironically, what I described three years ago, even before Loon ever came out, is precisely how they describe how they're doing it here. So I'm not, I don't want to ring my own bell, but you know what? Ding, 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 ding. There you no, have it. But, Let's continue. but man, you are the, the man of the night. The Nobel Prize, the Oscar, and now this match. Man, I mean, come on, leave something for the rest of us. Come on, please. I, I, I am a rock star, aren't I? <laughs> All right, let's keep going. Wait, I just want Biggest to... hurdle for a balloon. Oh, go ahead, Ben. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, think of the angles of those lasers they'd have to be at in order to communicate with each other. They're on a globe, supposedly. They'd have to all be angled in weird directions to try to communicate with each other. And also, yeah, they said know, hundreds of kilometers, they said. Yeah, right? I mean, how in the world can they communicate with each other when they're on a globe pointing out into space? I mean, that's not going to happen. But and, yeah. and did you notice that the balloons were moving? Just another idea that, you know, how they're saying that. <laughs> the laser is keeping track of each other with the balloons moving. I thought that was pretty hard to believe as well, but yep. I don't know. I don't know how it's done. Bob, Bob probably has some ideas. I, Maybe it's... I know how it's done. I, you know how it's done? <laughs> Yep. The earth is the earth is flat. That's how it's done. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't oh, have to yeah, overcome it, that it, stuff. It, yeah, you look at that yeah. diagram and it shows the balloons moving across the sky. So are they putting them in the jet stream? And, and does that explain now the Doppler effect with the, the GPS? Just a thought there. <laughs> yeah. It's so absurd, man. They really, really go through rigmaroles to try and make shit up. But okay, let's continue. This is this is really good. Moon is the wind. Once you've inflated the balloon, it gets quite large on the ground and acts as a large sail. It would catch the wind and it was really hard to control it. So then you try to find locations around the world that had zero wind. But then you're limited in scope because you can't find these perfectly wind-free zones that provide access to the location where you want to provide internet coverage. And then for a given launch site, the ideal wind conditions would only exist for a very short period of the day, thus limiting the number of balloons we could get up in that period of time. We wanted to do something where we could launch one every 20 minutes. And so we needed to rethink how you would launch a balloon. We wanted to develop a launch system that would allow us to block the wind. Okay, guys, so I just want you to think about something. We had a real 
I'm not even going to say what he is, but not too bright person make a comment about how this would be cost effective. And it's like, are you serious Uh, to the point where you've got to manufacture these things at the cost that is staggering for the helium, for the manufacturing, for the equipment, the radio equipment, the solar arrays to launch one every 20 minutes to literally do tens, 20, 30, hundreds of thousands of these balloons cost effective. What an idiot. I'm sorry, let's keep going. As much as possible, and it could launch balloons from a number of different remote locations and be nimble enough to deploy into a new area as we expanded the program. We went into a very controlled environment and launched many balloons and measured all of the, all of the aspects of that launch. And then from there, we developed our tooling in order to guide that motion. The auto launcher is 45 feet wide and 55 feet tall. The system is the four-tired steerable gantry crane, and we outfitted it with hangar doors that allows it to become a wind block. It's a highly customized piece of equipment. There's nothing else like this in the world. We lift the balloon right out of the box, so we don't ever have to do any extra handling to the balloon. We have jib cranes to lift up the balloon at the top of the balloon to secure it while we're filling it. The wind does not bother the team because we have the ability to steer the crane so we're always downwind. And when we're in the right wind pattern, we lift the entire perch up and then we angle the perch and then we launch the balloon. So where we had 16 people launching a balloon, We now can do it with four people, and we can do it in a very short period of time. We can now launch at will instead of at will of the weather, and we can launch in a consistent manner. So we can keep a continuous ring of balloons that circumnavigate the globe. The altitude that we fly at is actually above 99% of the atmosphere, which means that we have a lot of the same physical challenges as flying in outer space, and yet we still have to deal with the chaotic nature of the wind pattern. We need to know what the winds are in the stratosphere so we can surf those winds in order to go different places. Now, notice notice the graphic that they're using here, guys. They show the balloon moving in one jet stream, um, going up into another jet stream. And and by the way, this is portrayed beautifully on the AE, uh, used to be Null School map, now called Bob Winds. Um, where we have these winds aloft at different levels, right? And I have also covered, you know, ad nauseum before the the electro mag, electrostatic tethering that NASA is using, and and they're showing this. So essentially, what you do is you've got this balloon here, and you've got this tether hanging off the bottom of it. You change the electrostatic potential of that tether, and it goes up or it goes down depending on the charge potential that you put on that tether. Therefore, they can keep it within a restricted zone. And by the way, these, these you have to understand that these uh, satellite dishes that they say, oh, it has to be absolutely razor sharp, has to be within a couple of degrees. Well, yeah, it does have to be within a couple of degrees. But guys, you need to think about something. If you have something on the ground and you are supposedly going up to – um, even 150 to 200,000 feet, a couple of degrees on the ground uh, then equates at a couple hundred thousand feet up to a huge amount of real estate up there um, that it can be actually broadcasting to. Uh, not to mention that you know they can be using omnidirectional type of antennas up here. In other words, is this easy to fake? Actually, it really is. But you know, you get your typical satellite TV installation guy that thinks. Uh, uh, he knows it all and he knows nothing. Um, and they will try and make you think that, oh, well, if it isn't this absolute razor precision uh, line of sight beam, um, then you're not going to get anything. Not even realizing, you know, how much of a differential there is from ground to sky on these things. And not only that, think about this. What if those satellites were actually 23,000 miles out there? Um, you know, you'd be way overshooting it. Um, so it makes a lot more sense that these balloons, these transponders are much, much closer. All right, let's continue on. We've been using some wonderful data we have from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which gives us their best predictions of which directions the winds are blowing up in the stratosphere. They get their data from things like weather balloons, but as a weather balloon goes up, it gets larger and larger until eventually it pops. So the amount of time it spends in the stratosphere is pretty limited. 
In comparison, we all have a fleet of balloons that are in the air all the time. And of course we have GPS so we can see which ways the wind is blowing us. And so we all have a very rich stream of data coming into our system. You can kind of imagine putting a whole bunch of rubber ducks <laughs> on a lake or an ocean. Did you guys catch that? Of course, we have GPS so that we can tell which way the wind is blowing us. And right before that, they just said, well, we have to launch all these, these, these weather balloons so that we can tell all the conditions, including the wind direction. I mean, again, they just busted themselves dead to right, double speak. Yeah, we have to launch balloons so we can tell which way the wind's blowing so that we can tell you that that data is actually coming from GPS. And the question then becomes, how does a satellite 23,000 miles out into space uh, determine what the winds aloft are at different elevations on Earth? How does it do that? I would love to see that technology. Not possible. It's ridiculous. So... The reality is, and the common sense tells you, that yes, of course they need those weather balloons because those are the things that are actually giving you the data of winds aloft. Let's continue um, on for just a couple more. Oh, go ahead. Bob, if you yeah. just look at the chat, uh, I shared a photograph I took in an airplane coming from Sweden that explains how the, the airplane gets Wi-Fi from a satellite. And you should just read the double speak on it. It says that, in the bottom, it's going to say, it, uh, each time you visit a web page, a signal is sent to and from the ground. It travels a distance similar to four times around the planet. And then, <laughs> but then it's also using a satellite communication that's like 28,000 miles an hour, the kilometers an hour it moves. So there's a satellite in the sky. There's 82 spot beams across Europe. The satellite is in this position in the sky. But then when you visit a page, the signal goes to and from the ground and it goes as, and then four times around the planet is how much the signal travels. And somehow this is efficient and, and this makes sense. <laughs> do, 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 I know what's ridiculous about that. And gamers will understand this quite well. If this was actually what was happening, do you know what this would do to your ping times? They would be decimated. You couldn't play crap online with ping times like that, going up and down 28,000, four times, going around the world, 34. No, the internet is going through fiber optic underground cables. That's the way it is. Um, satellite would be completely, it just simply wouldn't work. Ping times would be ridiculous. So again, people use common sense. This, what, what is being put here is just utterly ridiculous. And it makes a lot more sense that even that, that they're sending it up to balloons at a couple hundred thousand feet because at the speed of light, uh, you know, a couple hundred thousand feet is microseconds, right? So that mm -hmm. will make no significant impact on ping times whatsoever. But yeah, good, good find there, uh, Rodrigo. So let me put that back and continue on. And watch where they float to, you'd get a very good idea of what the water currents are doing, whereas our balloons would show you what the air currents are doing. So this simulation shows how we use the wind data to predict a balloon's trajectory. In this video, the red dot in the center is the balloon, and the arrows around it are the predicted wind field. So you can see as the wind field changes. The red arrow shows the velocity of the balloon as it travels through this ever-changing wind field. One question you might have is, are our balloons actually flying at the same speed as the wind? And it turns out that we can tell that they are because we've actually flown microphones on our balloons and it's very quiet when we're flying in the stratosphere. That tells us there's no wind rushing past and that's because we're flying at the same speed as the wind around us. Yep, and one thing we also know is that, that at that elevation, we've also flown, you know, balloons. There's not a whole lot of wind. In other words, where the when you launch a balloon, and, you know, if you look at balloon data, either from, you know, like the ones that we launched or the one that Drain Column launches, the balloon does the, the major, the, the great majority of its traveling um, between probably zero and 70,000 feet. Once you go above that, um, the winds become... Um, they're not exactly affecting it all that much. I mean, uh, and yeah, there are certain bands, but these are well above, you know, where the pilots are flying. But um, the air gets so thin that even they're not having a whole lot of effect that are pushing these balloons around. And in, in theory, if the, the, if the Earth is rotating right underneath it, then the Earth would be rotating around, uh, away from these, 
these balloons, right? We, well, how does the mainstream explain that, right? It's like, well, yeah, they're going up to a couple hundred thousand feet. You know, these balloons supposedly are between one and 200,000 feet. Up there, there's really no atmosphere to be Velcroed to the Earth. And if the Earth is darting away at 1,000 miles an hour, it seems to me that these things would be pretty ineffective, wouldn't they? Yeah, maybe they would. Let's continue. <laughs> Right now, we're only flying a few balloons, but we're already gathering a lot of really exciting data that's helping us understand the stratospheric winds better. And as we have better understanding, that's enabling us to fly more balloons with greater confidence and provide ourselves with even more data. And so we have this ever-improving understanding of the stratosphere. We've actually been talking to NOAA and working with them to feed some of the data from our balloons back into their models. And as our fleet comes fully online, we'll be able to significantly improve the quality of the wind predictions that NOAA is able to provide to others as well. The goal of Project Loon is to bring internet to the almost two out of three people on the world who don't have internet access today. And we're doing that using high altitude balloons. And you gotta ask yourself, if if literally you can get 26,000 miles or 23,000 miles away from the Earth, which is way far enough for it to see in, in its entirety, people, entirely one half of the Earth, one satellite, one satellite could do the job. And so why would, why in the world would they want to launch tens of thousands of these balloons? Why would anybody in their right mind say this is cost effective um, when, when it simply is ridiculous? The, the reason is, is because they're not putting satellites 23,000 miles out. It is balloons. It always has been balloons and it always will be balloons. Um, so yeah, you, you, again, common sense people. Here we go. Let's finish the rest of this. the very first tests we did showed that it could work. So we began to think, wow, we're gonna need to have a manufacturing system that can manufacture many, many of these balloons. We're gonna need to have a mission control system that can keep track of the balloons. We're gonna need to have an operations team that can launch these balloons and then recover them when they're ready to come down. Operations, mission control, recovery of balloons. Yaddy, 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 yaddy. I mean, unbelievable expenditures, right? All for balloons. Makes no sense. I'm not going to uh, play any more of this, but uh, I just wanted you guys, and again, this will be in the show notes. I wanted people to see this because, I mean, really, when you put your common sense hats on and you think, why would they go through all this trouble when one single satellite could take care of all of it, half the Earth at a time? Theoretically, you could put two of them up there in geosynchronous orbit, 23,000 miles away, and cover the whole damn globe. And, and believe me, it would be far less expensive than launching tens of thousands of balloons and all the logistics that have to go along with it. It's just crazy. Um, any comments, guys? I, I wanted, did want to point out one fact, is that they do consider these, sat, these, these real balloon satellites to actually be in space as they've stated many times on their videos and also in, in their publications. But I actually was kind of curious myself and looked it up to see whether you could actually sue uh, these you know, space cable companies for, for false advertising. And if you look it up, a space system isn't actually defined as, you know, what you'd think would outer space is defined as, this is actually the definition from the CFR, it says any group of cooperating Earth stations and or space stations, uh, and um, I'm sorry, this is, uh, I'm reading the wrong definition. But anyway, what it basically <laughs> said is that if it moves on beyond uh, the majority of the Earth's atmosphere. Yeah, right here it says, a station located on an object which is beyond is intended to go beyond or has been beyond the major portion of the Earth's atmosphere. We all know the major portion of the Earth's atmosphere is located down below. So anything above that, they consider space. So, so they I mean, 100,000 feet and call that space because, yeah. like that said, it's above 99% of the atmosphere. Therefore, space. Yeah, so all, that's the only definition that they have for space is that it's a, above the majority of the Earth's atmosphere. So you can't go ahead and sue these, these these cable companies for not actually, you know, for false advertising because technically they are in space. And they also say that also in their literature. Just something I wanted to make point out. Yeah, just, just <laughs> redefine what space means. That's all you got to do. <laughs> uh, caramba, such craziness. All right. 
Okay, guys. Well, you know what? We've been over three hours, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. But uh, uh, again, I overprepared again. But uh, yeah, it just gives me more stuff to cover next week. But that's cool. That. I do that every time, you know. <laughs> so uh, what do I do? All right. So is there anything, first of all, anybody else wants to bring up before we close out the, the show at all? Or are we content? Are we happy? Yes. Okay, cool. All right. So let's go. Let's go ahead and go around uh, one time and uh, see what's going on with anybody. If they have anything, uh, Rodrigo, if you're still here, I think you are. Um, let's go ahead and start with you. Uh, what do you got coming up this week? Uh, just uh, continue with what I'm doing. <laughs> see the one thing at a time. I was really busy being very busy with different things, but finishing the album that I was uh, working on. So that's, that's coming out this week. And then, uh, finally, I'm going to put myself to the task and try to finish the vocals for the song with Alex. See how that goes. <laughs> oh, awesome. That's cool. Oh, You're goodness. working with Alex. That's, that's awesome. I wonder, I wonder what you guys are going to think about this, but <clears throat> I think, I think you're going to like it. It's, it's Alex after all. It's, it's great. Uh, and I just have to try and, and, you know, live up to it. <laughs> gonna see if it goes well. Yep. Well, Alex has got the Midas touch. It seems like everything he does is just gold. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. Yep. cool. Hey, Bob, I hate to jump position, but I got to run and do something. So I just want to thank everybody for watching and as always, keep an eye out on my channel and check out Raw tomorrow and the lounge on Friday and all that fun stuff. But it's been another great show, but I got to I gotta duck out quickly here. Okay, no problem. Okay. Uh, sounds good. We will uh, see you on Monday night on Raw. All right, talk to everybody later. Peace. All right, cool. All right, so uh, Iru, uh, obviously, are, are you still in? Are, you're still in Europe, yes? Iru left, I think, the building. Oh, he, oh did he? He you're... said he apologizes, had to go, and he says, "Remember my English channel, uh, Nur para todos NPT Red Pill." Yes, and which uh, is in the show and, notes. Yeah, he um, had to I, run. Okay. Cool enough. All right. Yeah. Your, your uh, English channel is in the show notes. I actually got around to doing that. Um, so it's in there if you want to go to his English channel. And um, yeah. So check out Ira Landucci. All right. So let's see. Ben, I guess uh, you're up next. Uh, what do you got coming up? Anything exciting? Oh, very exciting. We have some major experiments going on here. Well, I don't know if you use that word or not, but some major experiments here in Northern in Utah coming up uh, this weekend. It will be huge. I'm actually not sure if I'm going to be on the show because I'm going to be out uh, at, at uh, doing some some crazy stuff with with Wendell and the the, the Flat Earth Research Group from from California. So that that will be a lot of fun, and there's there's it's going I think it'll be pretty amazing. So I hope to have some some excellent information after that. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. That's right. I, I knew about that. The uh, salt uh, tests, the salt uh, salt flats test, which is going to be pretty cool. And, uh, you know, I was thinking I, if I can, if I can possibly do it, they have like flights out there for less than a hundred bucks. I'd really like to try and make it, but we'll have to see how my schedule goes this week. Oh, it, so. It'll be amazing. It's going to be amazing. I just hope it's I, I, I don't want to release too many details because I'm not sure if they want a bunch of globe fanatics to show up and cause problems, but I think this will be uh, huge. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. All right. And um, so, Austin, um, you're about to get a new laptop. Um, I know that it's on its way because I sent it there. And uh, so tell us uh, what you're going to be doing when you get that new laptop. And you are muted, by the way. Um, yeah, I, sh I should I should get the uh, the laptop, I guess, tomorrow or Tuesday. You can hear me? Oh yeah, I hear. You. I'm sorry, I was looking at the wrong icon. You're not muted. Go ahead. <laughs> um, and then yeah, so once I get the laptop, my what I really intend to do is to go live uh, and, and kind of just screen share at the same time, so we can we can kind of talk through some of this stuff. Of course, right now I'm pretty obsessed with what we've touched on during this episode. Just just looking through modern science and what they're mislabeling the ether as, and how they, ironically, they're they're proving it. Um, in many different ways for us. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just waiting to get, get the computer. YouTube doesn't want to let me go, uh, live on mobile for some reason still. So, uh, yeah, once I get that, I'll just be pretty consistently putting out content on my channel and uh, that's about it. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, at least I know that, uh, on the laptop you can go live cause I did do a, 
a test stream. Uh, I patted on private, so nobody ever saw it, but um, I was able to do a test stream on it and it worked really good. And uh, I think you're going to be, uh, you're going to be really pleased when you get that and everything, everything is going to come together for you. So looking forward to that. So excellent. Um, I guess that is everybody then guys. And uh, for me personally, um, you know, just we're still doing Globusters, still uh, uh, trolling the Globers and, and, you know, all that stuff that I do. And uh, I, I've got kind of a busy week this coming up week um, because we've got, we're getting to the point where, we're about to list our house and sell it and, you know, get ready to move and all that fun stuff that's coming up. So uh, I'll be kind of busy, but uh, still be here doing the shows. And uh, other than that, that's about all I have. So um, we're going to go ahead and call it a show, guys. And I think that is all I have. And if I forgot something or somebody, I apologize. And I'll, I'll get to it next week and send me an email and bitch me out or something like that. So <laughs> we'll go from there. All right, guys, take care of yourselves. See you next week. Until then, be good to each other. Don't lie to each other. Open your mind because there's truth inside. Peace out, everybody.